Um, did you ever get a get a chance to finish watching uh, Prelia Three Ride Part Two? Um, I I don't think so because I think what whoops, there's my phone. I think what I did. <clears throat> I've got my phone up to watch the chat because I don't, I don't have the actual like window up right now. I think what I right. did uh, is I, I I did the I watched the Oath Under Snow video, and then yep. you were like, "Well, hey, to really understand what's going on in Oath Under Snow, you got to go back and watch Three Rye and really kind of understand that story." And then that right. sent me back all the way to the be- the beginning of your Prelia retrospective, right? So right, after right. watching. Um, the Oath Under Snow video, I went back and watched, like, the part one video. Um, right. So I guess I'd be working my way back up to that. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't expect a reaction of, like, video series from this one. All, all I'll say is, at the end of uh, Oath, uh, Three Rye Part 2, I, I put in a teaser for a future video, and I wanted to see if you could guess what it was uh, based on what what was said. Because it, it, this it's not a reveal, but it's like there's a little teaser there for a future future video. So uh, I, no one no one's commented anything about it yet. So I was wondering if uh, anyone who watched my channel actually could get the reference as to to what it was. So um, I'll have to check that out. Um, also, if you have if you have anybody that um, watches your channel that would like to join us in chat, make sure to go ahead and. Uh, um, share the link to the stream on your Facebook or whatever, and try to get uh, some of the people that regularly watch your stuff in here as well. I have like a whole page of notes about stuff that I had to cut from the Excel video or stuff that was like, um, it just couldn't be, um, couldn't be included. It didn't fit or just had to kind of be, um, it wasn't, wasn't appropriate. Um, but, uh, I was going to do the same thing for uh, stuff about your Fate Zero Season 2 video, but I I guess I did the reaction video, so I kind of already said everything that I would have put in the notes here, so it's almost like now you have notes to give back to me about what I said about it already, right? Yeah. The, I think it's really going to be funny is that no one actually will have seen that reaction video, so a lot of the stuff we know that was said, it will be like, well, you, you said this over here, and it's all off a record, so... People be like, "What are they talking about?" Right, right. So yeah, I'll have to I'll have to kind of unpack that again to kind of uh, put it in the context. But um, um, okay. Did you share the links you need to share and everything? Uh, yeah, I sent it to like three or four people who I think who I think would actually be interested in watching this. Okay. Um, uh, so we, Eric, looks Eric, like we Eric one. <laughs> Say again. Uh, Eric was one of them. You okay, know, uh, cool. Uh, our... Yeah. Yeah, love that guy. He was yeah. one of the uh, first people we did the interviews for when I back when I did, um, I guess, episode, episode zero. zero of the retrospective yeah. where um, he did a or he did one of the interviews for that segment where um, everybody was talking about how they got into Type Moon and what their favorite work was. And right. um, that whole segment is one of everybody's favorite moments from me making the series. They were like, oh, cool, I get to be a part of this. And it was really well cut together. And then like. Shang shows up with his uh, equipment and like his microphone, and we had this really cool setup where everybody was walking out of the panel and lining up and getting an interview right there. And right. Uh, people kind of started expecting that at the next cons after that, but we never we never did it again because it was just for that one sequence. And I think I think I cut that one sequence by itself and put it as a standalone video on the actual um, the official Type Moon Southeast channel. Um, I, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure you did. I think I remember seeing the the link for that. Yeah. So that's if people didn't want. I mean, I if if people legitimately are not interested in in my video series, I I it's fine. I don't I don't expect people to yeah. to sit through it. But if they wanted to see their contribution in that little interview skit, then you know, makes sense to have it as a standalone video, right? And um, that is completely relevant to the entire cosplay group we have here in the south like you know it's everyone shares their testimony of how they came to be part of this community and part of this family so yeah especially when you consider that like nobody's no two people's experiences were really the same i mean there was um i was actually shocked as well whenever when everybody said 
what their favorite work was was also really surprising because uh it was like like a landslide unanimously just um zero and extra is what everybody said there was there was like two people that said the original visual novel was their favorite and then there was like the one person that said well obviously joey said melty blood uh, Anthony said Carnival yep. Phantasm. No, no, uh, he yes. said a Cardinal Kyokai. Lucas said Carnival Phantasm just to be like a troll. <laughs> but um, I, I don't blame him though. Carnival Phantasm is spectacular. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a fair <laughs> point. I'm like, I'll, 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 I won't take that away from you. Um, so, uh, all right. So what we wanted to do tonight is uh, we wanted to do like a little behind the scenes discussion on the the production of some of our recent videos. So the um you've had you have had quite a long um streak of good videos coming out lately and i actually wanted to take this moment i noticed this earlier but i didn't say anything i wanted to take this moment to um congratulate you on two like home run hits with the battle network videos because you just knocked out of the park with those two from a view count standpoint like they, right. both of those Battle Network videos are doing really well. Have you, have you seen that? Yeah, the uh, the Battle Network Iceberg video is one that I'm actually more proud of because I put more effort <clears> into it. It's definitely not my best work editing wise. I can I can readily admit to that. But yeah, you know, I've still got fans coming out of the woodwork and commenting on it. And the thing is, we, I actually sparked discussion and we're talking about things about the Battle Network series that I didn't even know, and I've actually learned some things from the comment section. But the uh, the Battle Network collection bootleg cartridge thing actually. In less than two weeks, it's already jumped up to like twelve hundred views or so. So yeah. that's been my uh, that's been like my fastest growing video that I've had in like the last three years. Not counting like some meme videos from back when I first started the channel. Like I remember I did uh, like Undertale stuff actually netted a lot of viewers several years ago. So I did like some Undertale memes and I like recorded an Undertale panel at a con and posted it. Those got a lot of views. And funnily enough, my camera reviews that I did. I've gotten a lot of views on those, but I'm not te- I'm not very tech savvy, so it was just a little small thing. Right on. So yeah, yeah. I just I I saw the, that uh, when I was looking for the Fate Zero season two video to uh, to give you my reaction on it, and I I saw the two Battle Network videos. Uh, how how many views they've gotten? I was like, I was like, bravo, right on. I think I think you struck gold with that. I think that that is a niche that you definitely need to um, uh, focus in on because clearly there's an audience there that. Uh, it's it's a fan base that it like wants to be talked to and they need they're hungry for more content about this series like they really are. The only problem I'm having with this is yes this is a freaking gold mine and this is my absolute favorite game series the one that I am probably most passionate about. The only problem is I already made plans for like 3 years worth of videos which a, a lot of them got derailed. Well, well I I can talk about that here in a little bit when we actually get on the thing but the problem I'm having is I'm weighing up of uh, stuff that brings in viewers and that I am completely, truly passionate about versus things I've already made plans for that I kind of want to do because I think I should do it. Yeah, you know? I know exactly how you feel as far as that goes, too. But, I mean, you don't have to stop any of your current plans. But if you wanted to, like, sort of intersperse Battle Network videos in there, you could. Also, uh, Eric is in chat, so he is here joining yeah. us. Um. One of uh, shout out to Eric as well. He's been one of our biggest supporters through these these projects for sure. Has been uh, has always so, has we, awesome we actually, feedback on. Go ahead. So is the stream the stream actually live right now? We we yeah. actually on? Yeah, we're up. All right, let's go. Well, um, uh, but yeah. So I wanted finish, to uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry. Uh, to finish up the thought that I had a second ago, uh, I don't know if you watch the channel updates I post, but uh, my, my buddy uh, Ed, he does the channel with me. He actually uh, moved moved to a different state uh, back during July, and uh, that kind of derailed a whole lot of my plans for the next few years because a lot of the scripts that I was writing in my head and looking several months into the future for what videos I wanted to make, they kind of hinged on him being here with the stories that I was writing because you, you've noticed that I... At this point, sometimes I feel like I'm I'm a Channel Awesome clone because I like to intersperse some specific skits in with my videos somehow. Mm-hmm. And some of the ones I was writing, they <clears> hint <throat> upon him being here and being part of it. And then he moves away, and the you know, I I don't I don't I don't put any blame on him at all. You got to go where life takes you. You got to go where opportunities are, and you got to do what's best for you. And uh, that's uh, 
but that actually kind of, I guess, sparked the want to get into producing Battle Network content. So I remember thinking to myself, you know, I'm, I'm kind of bummed that my, my best friend moved away. We can't have gaming nights anymore. So what do I do now? Well, this type of video is really popular. And, you know, it's, I see one, uh, there's iceberg memes, which there's one for literally just about everything out there. And I found one for Mega Man Battle Network. And I'm like, no one's made a video on it yet? Dibs, let's do this. So I just got to, just got to flex my, my geek muscles and just completely nerd out about my favorite game series. And that's kind of what led me into that, just the, the whole thing of he's not here anymore, so all my other plans are put on hold. <laughs> yeah, I I know that feeling too. Like I I can't think of a particular video project with like a ton of production quality where I was dependent on another person. But like with all the Yu Gi Oh content, for example, like that's dependent on yeah. me having like another person to play off of. And so like me and Michelle play, but like I had two other friends that I used to go play with all the time, and they just they kind of got out of the game when, especially in the in the last era and uh so it's like ooh i really just wish i had them available to to do just a fun random match that could be a video and there were so many different combinations of matches that i wanted to do as a video that weren't viable without an opponent so uh i definitely know how you feel with that one um but yeah i um so, uh, I definitely want to hear about what your plans are for the the like the because I know you wanted to do like a a game by game battle network retrospective. Is that true? Yes, yes, that is one hundred percent true. I think that each game in the series uh, brings enough new to the table that it is worth discussing on its own merits and to show how the series has evolved over time in both good and bad ways and. Uh, it's hard for me to pick, like, I, I, I've talked about this before, I want to do a kind of a ranking video to decide which one I think is the best in the series, but I'm having the trouble deciding, do I do, like, ranking it best to worst, or do I do it like the the uh, S to F rankings that a lot of people do? Do I give it just a numerical grade? Can I two would, games have a score? Yeah, yeah I would do a tier list, because that way you don't necessarily put, you can put some games as equal to each other in, in certain tiers without, if you wanted to. Up. And then uh, tier list videos are super popular as well. Uh, yeah, I did. <laughs> I did a tier list video for the Zoids GameCube game, basically talking about all the different Zoids that are available in the game, and yeah. said this is how they rank within the context of that game. Um, right. <clears throat> so, um, okay. So I wanted to. I had. I have like a whole page of notes here. I wanted to go through about the Excella video of stuff that I have cut yeah. from the game. And then I kind of wanted to hear if you had any any questions or anything you wanted me to unpack from from the Extella videos. Which, first of all, I really appreciate anybody who watched it. I mean, you you have watched them, so thank you tremendously for sitting through nearly yeah. three hours of content. Um, I did not intend to make three hours of content, but when I was writing the script, I didn't think, "Oh my god, this is too heavy. There's too much chaff. I need to cut some of this out." Like that thought never really crossed my mind because. The amount of stuff I included versus cut was about the same level that I would do on any of the other previous videos, but it's like a 25-hour yeah. game, um, as opposed to the anime series that are, I don't have to juggle uh, story content and, and gameplay content as well. Um, yeah. And of course, the very beginning of the, of the video is very heavy on... Um, explaining the gameplay, explaining all these other mechanics, the uh, the platinum trophy thing. And I had a friend who actually knows nothing about Faith that watched it just to see how far I've come from an editing standpoint because he's followed me for a long time. And he was right. like, he was like, you kind of lost me there when you went off on a tangent about the platinum trophy. And I'm like, yeah, that was a little excessive, <laughs> but uh, it was kind of intentional as well because it was um. It was basically like, you know, this ridiculous... It was to kind of show the ridiculousness of why is he obsessing so much over this dumb Platinum Trophy thing. And, and uh, you know, why is he obsessing so much about the code cast? And it was kind of this this big over-the-top thing about, um, 
uh, obsessing over the last little details because I just you know love that game so much. It reminds me of uh, uh, speaking of Channel Awesome. I don't know if you ever watched um, Spoonie, but when he did the video about the um, the Commodore sixty four version of uh, Big Trouble in Little China. He's like, I, I haven't seen that one. I haven't seen that one. I've seen like one or two of his videos. That wasn't one of them. <laughs> so he, um, he does this big ridiculous thing where he's like, I don't want to play my, a game based on my favorite movie when the wrong aspect ratio and frame rate. So I had to buy a German Commodore 64 with a data set deck and a converter box and all this stuff. And, and, uh, his girlfriend walks in the room and is like, so why didn't you just play this on an emulator? And it's like, he he looks like just an absolute maniac sitting there, and that was kind of the energy I was channeling with that with that gag. But um, anyway, so the game's uh, OP. It's a song uh, called "Extella" by a uh, an artist named Elisa, and uh, <clears throat> it is awesome. It slaps, and I couldn't really talk about it in the video, and I definitely couldn't play any of the audio for it because it would get copyright blocked immediately. Um, yeah, and like you, you remember my Fate Zero season uh, one videos. Uh, was it part one and two, or just part one? No, it's part one and two. Both of them actually got copyright struck and uh, got taken down uh, during the first uploading. Uh, uh, in the little uh, reaction video you did for part two that you sent to me specifically, you uh, said, "I don't know what music this is, but it's fitting enough." That's actually just some royalty-free fa- uh, fantasy music that I found on YouTube to avoid that thing from happening again. Uh, right, I figured. And I, I figured uh, that's what you had to do. Yeah. Yeah, I, I linked them in the description of that video, but yeah, like, I was not expecting that. That's actually why I kind of stopped fake content for a while on my channel. You remember I was, like, shotgunning fake Grand Order stuff back-to-back, and then all of a sudden, these videos that I posted, like, three years ago, they're like, this servant rank up with that's just gameplay and background music because I cannot record good audio off my phone with the current model that I have. And I'm like, okay, well, I, I don't need to have background sound, so let's just have fate music playing in the background all of a sudden out of nowhere video has been up for three years now they're getting copyright notices and, and they're getting blocked and i'm like all right you know what screw it fate grand order you're off the channel you're done <laughs> yeah the uh yeah it's interesting i think it must have been sony that like added was, additional copyright criteria to yeah. the algorithm or whatever but it was um, definitely sony because they're, they're the ones i got the notices from yeah whatever the record label is that owns that uh that extella album which I do own, of course I do. Um, they that even as far back as 2016, when I first started doing like the, I, I did a let's play for Extella years and years ago when the game was new, and that OP would get copyright flagged immediately, and probably result in a global block. So I had to, um, I had to cut it. But I did after I did that whole live stream where I live streamed the entire game. I realized I don't have footage of the OP. And I wanted to use some of the uh, shaft animation from the OP as uh, filler footage in the in the review, and so I go back and record yeah. it, and I don't play any of the audio of it. But the footage from it, the video, I guess, is has a different copyright on it, which is also owned by. Yep. Um, I don't know if it if it's actually owned by Shaft or what it is, but the OP itself, just the visuals of the OP, have a separate copyright on them as well. Um, they do. So I was like, okay. Um, so my only, my one and only copyright claim on part one is for the OP. Um, and, but I love that song. That OP slaps so hard. And, uh, funny enough at, at AWA in 2017, um, she was at the con doing a concert and, uh, James, the guy that does the panel with us, he went to that concert and I was like, oh, man, I didn't realize that person was going to be here. They did the Extella opening. And he's like, yeah, yeah, that was her opener. And I was like, that was her opener? Holy oh. shit. I was so mad because I could have literally just the way that the concerts work at, at AWA is sometimes you, you can walk, walk into it. Yeah, you can you can just walk into the into the, the Grand Hall or whatever and just see it at the back of the room. And just with how much I've grown to increasingly like that song more and more over the years, I would have killed to have seen that live but i have seen um uh air Aoi live so i've seen the uh um fate zero season one outro uh song which also is awesome yeah 
Yeah, uh, circling back around to the uh, set for copyrights, that's actually something that I faced when doing the Fate Zero video as well, because not only did I get copyright struck uh, from Sony for the music, uh, but it was also a thing of... One thing that I've learned to do is uh, do test uploads in lower video quality just to see if they'll get past the copyright police. And uh, some of the edits I've had to make have actually led to a couple of choppy frames here or there, like back during my JoJo review and Fate Zero Part 1. Uh, there was like one snippet where I let the footage go for just slightly too long and it got blocked. It was when uh, El Malloy is grilling uh, Waver about his paper. And I had to <clears throat> cut it just ever so slightly, trim it up, and then that got past the copyright block no problem. But it did lead to a little bit of choppy editing in the second version that I released. But yeah, that's, that's that you got to not only not only worry about the visual copyright, but you also got to worry about the audio copyright. And one thing that I still cannot for the life of me figure out how to get around is the copyright for the Elfender Snow movie, because to, the, to this day, I still only have the still the still frame version of that video posted on my channel, because no matter how many times I cut the footage, recut the footage, flipped it, add all kinds of crazy filters, it still got blocked by the person who owned the, the company that owned the rights to the movie. Like, yeah, they, they, they were playing around with that one. Now. No, you remember you remember me going through all that because I was supposed to be like a New Year's Eve special, and I, I post it, and then it's like, yeah, it's up for like one day, and then uh, uh, dispute the copyright claim, so it stays up for like <clears> four <throat> days, then it's taken down. I'm like, all right, well, let's do this. So I go, I do the still frame version where it's basically like a comic dub, and I'm like, this is not what I want my content to be, but this is the only way to get this up. Yeah, yeah, you tried I, I like just... three separate times to get that to go through too, which sucks. At bare minimum, but uh, at uh, I, I hope that people come to my channel when they watch my videos. They're not here just to watch the anime or movie, but they're here to see my reaction, and my take on things. So I try to remind myself of that—that that the commentary is the more important aspect than what is actually being watched, at least in the in the context of the video itself. At least I hope that is true. Uh, you know, different people watch different videos for different reasons. So yeah, um, Eric says as well that he actually saw that concert anyway, so he got to see that that live. Uh, <laughs> um but um so i i i know how you feel there because i'm actually the the retrospective another retrospective series i'm planning on working on is a um the complete um creative works of uh, yasuhiro naito who made uh trigun and yes. uh when i get around to doing the Gungrave anime it's like i don't think i can actually use any unedited footage of the Gungrave anime because the soundtrack is um, owned by Victor Entertainment and they will snipe that shit immediately as soon as they hear it. And uh, so that actually made it difficult to play the games because uh, the second game has some of the anime's soundtrack in it and I have right. to kind of edit around that. But um, So it might be a similar formula to the other anime videos I've done, but I won't show any. It'll be pure narration and no on it un edited clips because as soon as i play any of that audio they're gonna they're gonna snipe it right away um yeah uh, another instance of this it was on one of my less edited clips it was back when i was doing the fake grand order uh prisma Ilya event just some of the uh ost from prisma Ilya was playing in the game and just because it was playing in the background i got copyright notice it didn't get blocked but it, it got a notice on there which uh which that's not terrible it just means can't monetize it which i ain't monetized yet anyway so it doesn't matter yeah. but uh that's that's one where it uh, it's like you got to jump through all these hoops, and I'm like, how are, how are we supposed to make gaming content when all this stuff is, is copyrighted? And especially since YouTube's copyrights uh, system and trying to fight it is absolutely completely broken. Like sometimes it is. Uh, I actually, if you go back far enough, I actually got a um, copyright claim that resulted in a global block on one of my Dean reviews and actually got it removed. I successfully got it revoked, which again, I don't know what nice. the criteria is for them to like manually review those, uh, those appeals, but um, yeah, sometimes it works. Um, yeah. I, I didn't even get a chance to, uh, to, to appeal, repeal the uh, appeal, repeal, whichever to uh, uh, dispute the fate zero videos. They just got smacked down immediately or not immediately, but completely, nuked from orbit after like a week or two of being up just yeah. completely destroyed and i'm like okay well, fine don't, don't even give me a chance to present my case i remember a couple of times i've uh i've been hit with copyright block at, at first but then i'll dispute it and it'll get cleared up like uh my castlevania netflix videos those those got disputed and dismissed very very easily uh netflix apparently wanted people to 
to know about this because it, it took me less than 24 hours to get those cleared up when the footage was copyrighted. But I remember one thing. It was actually, funny, funnily enough, the outro song for uh, Castlevania Season 1's review was the opening lick of uh, Dragon Force's song, Curse of Darkness, which, if you don't know, the opening guitar lick for that is uh, is the same rhythm as Bloody Tears. It's a Castlevania song, and the backbeat oh. for the Dragon Force song is it's Bloody Tears from Castlevania. So I'm right. like, I'm only using the instrumental, it's the very beginning, and it's just the 20-second outro music. Nope, still got, still got blocked, and I, I disputed that. That didn't go anywhere, so I'm like, all right, you know what? It's literally the end of the video, just chop the audio off, we're good. Um, do you want to guess where I got my copyright claim on the Season 2 video, or the uh, Part 2 Excella video? Um, let me see. Because it's pretty mm -hmm. obvious. <laughs> what, was it the uh, the... If it, if it wasn't just the OST in general, was it during the outro? Nope. No. No. Um, it's the only time I put any the, uh, any outside audio in there from something else. Hmm. Like the one joke I told in the, in the whole video. Oh, Snoop Dogg, Snoop Dogg. Yeah. <laughs> Gilgamesh. <laughs> yeah, which Gilgamesh is like the second Snoop. time I've, or actually I guess the third time I've made a Gilgamesh joke. I guess people are going to get the wrong idea and think I like this character or something. But, um... Now on on, the, on that note, just tiny little things is you you just watch my Fate Zero review, you understand I despise this character. I got plenty of jokes in store for Gilgamesh in the future, so don't worry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he uh, he's actually great in uh, in Extella because he we don't get to see him be like a piece of shit to anybody like we do in the mainline yeah. Fate stuff. Um, yeah, and he just he just kind of comes in handy because he just kind of sits off to the side and. and assesses everything going on and then uh comes into play when we need him the most um so the next little note that i have is uh, i mentioned in i mentioned to get the platinum trophy in extella you need to you need to get 100 percent completion in the gallery which includes every single conversation in the game every single bond conversation and there's Whoa. one of these that is missable and uh, you don't realize that it's missable because the criteria for unlocking it, which I would never have known this had I not looked it up, is that in the very first mission, um, you can, if you if you fail or you quit out of the first mission, you get some, some dialogue with Nero where she's like, whew, I guess you weren't ready for that yet. We may need to take it easy here a little bit. And that's a unique conversation that, contributes to your 100 percent um wow and so i had to then go and do that in order to get that conversation i was like i was never gonna find that who fails the first mission but um uh and it kind of made me think i was like well technically if you really want to think about it extella doesn't really have a fail state when you think about it because every time you actually fail it just leads to another conversation with your servant where they're they're kind of like, oh, well, that was a shame. We should try better next time. And so it's almost like they've canonized your your attempted failure. Um, but that doesn't really match the the um, the Ludo narrative aspect of the gameplay of you have to have a fail state. You know what I mean? Yes. The, um, um, yeah, Eric is saying the Excel Platinum I, looks like it would be absolutely painful, even compared to the Dark Souls Platinum that he has. Um, that uh, I, I don't know about that. I mean, I'm I'm right on track for getting the Excel Platinum. I only have a couple little things left to go, um, and I don't know what Dark Souls requires, but I'm not good at the Souls games, so you probably have that. You probably have an advantage there. I, I just I I don't have I haven't gotten good yet, as the kids say. Yeah. I, I I haven't beaten Excel yet. Like actually, the story behind that is me and me and uh, Ed were actually uh, let's play in this one for the channel, and then we beat Nero's first arc. We like we got to the part we defeat the White Titan, and then after that, about a week or so goes by, the PS4 crashes and we lose all of our progress, and we just haven't picked the game back up yet. So we got through like the first quarter of the game and haven't haven't tried again since. But yeah, going back and missing that that early on for 100% completion, that's that is really really specific. That's like saying that to complete I don't know, a level in Goldeneye, you have to find a weapon that's like the first guard is carrying you. You're not even going to look for it if yeah. you got something better, you know. 
Um, it's not as bad as you would think. Also, is um, Drizzle Daydream? Is that Brie? Oh uh, yeah, that's Brie. Okay, cool. That's my wife. Hello, Brie. Um, so that's not as so. At least with that conversation, you can just go back and do it again, and you don't really lose any progress. Um, I was actually yeah. playing. Um, Michelle and I were playing through uh, Final Fantasy X earlier this year because it's my favorite game of all time, and she was playing through it for the first time on the Switch remaster. And the Switch yeah. remaster has all of the international edition. Well, all of the HD versions have the international edition content. And some of the, if you haven't played the game, the international edition content is super bosses. And um, to get one it, of the most powerful, Hearts final mix. yes, exactly. Uh, to get one of the, to get one of the items required to get one of the best summons in the game. You have to go, you have to get the secret item in every single one of the temples you visit throughout the game. Yeah. But we missed the item in the very, very first temple. Only problem is when you try to go back there, one of the super bosses is guarding it. (laughs) And so we were like, I I told her, I said, we're fucked. We, we would have to completely restart a new save file. We can't, we cannot beat this super boss. We're going to have to just skip the best summon and go to the end of the game without it. She's like, why? I'm like, trust me, you cannot beat this thing. It has 800,000 health. Good luck. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, I wanted to talk about something that I, I I cut out of the Extella script. I mentioned I, I used the word a lot in the in the stream and in the Let's Play. Um, but you'll notice yeah. every time they, ch- every time an enemy faction sends a group of enemies into one of your sectors, um, they use the term Blitzkrieg, which um, I looked up what the term actually means because obviously it has a very um, sensitive cultural significance. And so I was yeah. like, well, does it does it literally just mean invasion in German? And I guess the short answer is yes. But the problem is that, um, yes, it means invasion, which is the context we would use it in here, but it's it also refers to a very specific military invasion tactic used during Lightning World War II. So yep. I was like, I should probably cut that out and not use that in the script. Um, if anybody was curious as to why I didn't say that. <clears throat> Um, you see it on the screen a couple times, though. Every time they send a, uh, <clears throat> every time they send an enemy uh, aggressor into one of your sectors, it says Blitzkrieg, enemy invasion, and it's like, okay. Um, I, I was also always, I was, I've always been under the impression that it not only meant like a strong military move, but also meant counterattack because of the context I heard it in. Uh, like you said, Fate Stella, it always happens when it's like, hey, here's a big push. But then also, um, I know we've talked about Macross a little bit. You ever watch Robotech? Um, no, I actually have not seen Robotech. I've only seen a couple of okay. the different. I think I've seen like the Macross movies. Like, do you remember Love, Macross right. 2 and Macross Plus is what I've That's seen. Cool. Well, I'm sure you're aware that the uh, that Robotech, the Macross saga is Macross itself, but with uh, the early English dub. Right. Well, they, uh, they're they talking about how we're going to get past the Zentradi. They said, well, let's do a Blitzkrieg. And they're like, a counterattack? Really? So he just u- uses it kind of nonchalantly. But that's actually the name of the episode. The episode's called Blitzkrieg, if if I'm not mistaken. I need to yeah. double check on that. But he yeah. said, Blitzkrieg this counterattack. So th- that's always just kind of what I associated the word with. It's like, yes, it's a term from World War II. But that's I always thought that it, it was a unexpected retaliation kind of thing. Yeah, was, I mean, you can... I guess that's the kind of thing with with uh, phrases like that is you can try to um, separate them from their from what we associate them with, but with with anything involving like World War Two and Nazis and stuff like that, it's very hard to separate the associative meaning from any other meaning. So I was like, I wasn't saying that like yeah. the game it wasn't sensitive for including the word or anything. It was just like no. I just don't feel like saying it more or less. Um, yeah. There was there was famously a uh, there was also a, a Yu Gi Oh card that was uh, the translation of it was changed because um, the translation from like the, the Japanese to English translation was going to be Blitzkrieg bombardment and they changed it into what the hell did they change it to um, I don't remember but they 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 sent they 
I guess censored it there or just eliminated the word to avoid any controversy. Um, right. So well, let's uh, like stemming off of that. Uh, there was a uh, old Pokemon card. I want to say it was. I want to say the name of it was Koga Scrap or something to that effect. But uh, the uh, the German symbol used during World War II, the swastika, is actually uh, very similar to, and I think it was derived from a symbol from. Uh, I want to say it's Buddhism. It's like a shrine symbol, and the card had that image on it in the Japanese version because it's associated with Buddhism. If uh, I if I re- I may be getting it wrong, it's a religious symbol of some sort. But because of the connotation, I think it's a elsewhere, Hindu symbol actually. It, it's Hindu, not Buddhism. Yeah. Okay, I, I I apologize. I uh, I got that wrong. My bad. But uh, yeah, so I, it, I could be wrong too. <laughs> uh, well, it, it's a. Uh, it is a religious symbol of sorts, and but give, given the context that the modified version of the symbol has been used <clears> for, and that is known elsewhere on the in the world for, it, they're like, yep, nope, that's definitely not good. Let's take that off of there. So they just remove that, remove the symbol from the card, and it just carried on its way. Yeah, that's a perfect um, example of what I was talking about with like you can't separate the associated meaning from whatever meaning you try to apply to it. Right. Um. Okay, so I hope that I didn't get too much flack for what I tried to cut from uh, Tamamo's route because I I feel like I was pretty fair and that I included most of the dialogue that was relevant and I summarized her her character arc. Um, well, uh, uh, Eric is the uh, the resident uh, Tamamo fanboy, so if he's still in the chat, let's uh, let's ask him about that. <laughs> right, that, that's why I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to piss off the Tamamo fans because there, there are some very loyal Tamamo fans that um, absolutely love this character, and I like, I, I, I like her too, if I'm being perfectly honest. But, um, but I, <laughs> I was Eric like, says you are forgiven. <laughs> I, I, I want to like, okay, so I'll give you an example of some of the things that I thought were funny that I cut out. So there's a couple of conversations with Tamamo that just go nowhere, but are really funny. Like there's one where um, she has this dumb acronym that she uses and um, I I can't even remember what it is, but it's like uh, it was clearly the localization team at XSEED having some fun with the dialogue where it's like, um, it's like, but um, the sound your heart makes when you get really excited when we get into trouble, like we've been getting into. And it's like um, she just kind of weaves that into her. what it was but it was like a it was intentionally like a poorly formed acronym because the localization team was just having fun um yeah there was actually i mean and tamamo's route is the not the only route where this stuff happens and so there's one in altera's route as well which is my next little note that i have here where there's this re i didn't show any of this in the in the video because i didn't think it was relevant um because the drama is so high when you get to altera's route that you just don't have time for this stuff but there's a there's a yeah reoccurring joke in Altera's route where you're sitting there in the cage for a week and then she realizes she's like you have to eat don't you I haven't given you any food <laughs> and I'm I'm like see she's like well the only thing I really learned about humans was how to destroy them I never really learned about how often they have to eat or anything so you have to forgive me I'll just I'll cook something up for you so she gives her food and it's this reoccurring joke of like oh yeah I uh, I mixed in some attack programs into the food for you to add some nutrition. And Hakuno's like, what the fuck? And uh, just like freaks out. And then um, uh, she does it again later where she's like, yeah, yeah, there's like a there's like a native fell beast that lives in the Zero Dark that I cooked up and threw in here for you. And, and Hakuno's like, and Altera's like, just kidding. <laughs> and... Uh, <clears throat> it reminds me of that, that that one skit from Carnival Phantasm where uh, Arkway, is that how you pronounce her name? The uh, yeah. Hime vampire. Like she's trying to cook that dish for uh, for Shiki, and like she's like, "Well, octopus is kind of like squid." <laughs> and go, goes off and like gets all the wrong things and presents him this abomination that she she's like, "I did good." And he's like, "Yeah, sure." <laughs> I, I just kind of just kind of get that idea. It's like you have good intentions, but you have no idea what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was funny. Those those are two examples of like stuff in the game that's funny but has no place. So I was like, okay, we're we're gonna cut this out. Um, yeah. So here's something really funny. So the um, when I go off on that tangent about the um, when I go off on that tangent about the the platinum trophy and it's the alternate camera angle where I'm sitting in this chair looking at this computer. You know what I'm talking about in the first video? I think so. Yeah. 
So I had to <laughs> rearrange some things in the room when I filmed that because there is a Rin Tosaka body pillow sitting right there <laughs> next to me outside of the frame that I had to move out of the way because I can explain the context of why I have that in this setting, but I couldn't just stop the video in the middle and be like, oh yeah, this uh, Toast Hog Body Pillow, yeah, this is just an inside joke with me and a friend, because uh, it would just kill the pace of the whole thing. So I'm like, let me just take it out of the frame and not have to explain it. But more or less, the joke was, um, my, you've met Michael, right? Um, our friend Michael? Um, I don't know many people in the fake group names personally unless that's what they have as their facebook title just because i i live in alabama and y'all y'all live over in georgia most of you okay. so i i yeah yeah that's, um, fair. that's fair he, uh, he actually know, went he actually went to comic con with me one year um he got that for me as a as a like gag gift for christmas one year but what was really funny about it was when you order like a, a body pillow case or whatever they send it to you like folded up and in like a little bag or whatever so I had yeah. this feeling in the back of my head. I'm like, I know Michael's going to give me something embarrassing for Christmas that year. And I ex actually expected that it was going to be something like this. But I expected that he would just give it to me in the case. And I'm like, okay, thanks. And just hide it under the bed kind of thing and not have to address it. No, he was like, oh, it didn't come with a pillow. I got to go get one for it. So he buys one of those pillows and in inserts it in there and carries it up my staircase with it like flopping back and forth in his arms He's carrying it up my staircase to go out of my house with it. And I'm like, oh, my God. Um, like a and, boss. <laughs> yeah, and this was, this was years ago. And even Michelle was like, Michelle, like, helped him pick it out to be like, please at least get the one that's, like, not super vulgar looking. And so yeah. um, so they picked one out that wasn't, like, disgustingly gross artwork. Yeah. <clears throat> um, uh, the, the things you find at conventions, man. <laughs> Yeah, so um, here's something that I, I want to know if this worked from a writing standpoint or from a from a uh, script standpoint because I was very conflicted about this while I was writing the script, but I just decided to kind of roll with it, is that um, throughout the script, I found myself referring to Hakano in the first and third person interchangeably, and I just want to know if yes. that got confusing because I a lot of times when I would say, I would say we, us, I, her, Hakano, like all those different things interchangeably. And so it was like, okay, am I talking about myself as the, like, or you as the player, as the audience proxy insert for the protagonist? Or am I talking about the protagonist as a person with individual agency? And it was kind of like, well, uh, did that get confusing or was that fine? Uh, to, to my personal perspective watching it, I thought it was, uh, it was very well done. And you seem to use the, correct uh personage uh, at the correct appropriate times you would say uh we as the player because it's not just a thing of you're just doing a game walkthrough you are carrying us with you on this journey and we're experiencing it with you i noticed that you included a lot of uh, game specific moments where you're talking about yeah well you got to fight this guy here's what i did and i i won in like two seconds or i got killed by this and it, it it felt not just as a review, but more like a, a like half review, half walkthrough. So we were kind of experiencing it with you. So anytime you'd say uh, we or you as the player, that actually felt perfectly fine. But then you'd refer to Hakano by name during the story relevant moments, especially if it was primarily dialogue and less about the action. It was more so just to help push the narrative along. And uh, because when it comes to the game's narrative a lot of times you don't directly influence it, so it's less of your control, and it's more of what the writers decided the character is going to do as that character. We don't necessarily get that. So I, I thought it was fine. I, I, I didn't think it was hard to follow at all. Yeah, because I guess the thing I try to remember is that, you know, at the end of the day, Hakano is a, um audience proxy, self-insert kind of protagonist, where... Um, which which did just... not translate well at all to Fate Extra Last Encore. Yeah, oh. as as I pointed out at the end of uh, part two, there, um, that and like the the Gudao, uh being just a complete wet blanket in the Grand Order adaptations, um, but um, so I, I tried to tell myself, well, it's like okay, I can ha if I say we or us, that I'm referring to the character like Hakuno, her servant, and 
us the the player slash narrator who's along for the, the avatar that the well. player has control over in that immediate moment is yeah. what I took from it. Yeah. Um, I also guess it's worth mentioning. I mentioned this at the at the beginning, so I got a really interesting question um, at the one of the it was the MomoCon panel I think in 2017, and somebody was talking about um, Extella. It was an Elizabeth Bathory cosplayer, ironically enough. And um, I remember her. I remember she her. was like, D- "Did you find like the story to be kind of like misogynistic or kind of sexist, where it's like, oh, you're just you know." you know, boy characters surrounded by all these girls. And I'm like, I guess I can you see can your point, but just play as yeah. the girl. And so that was kind of my, I, I never thought about it that way because I always picked the girl character and most mo- like nine out of 10 times, whether it's extra CCC or Extella, people always seem to pick the girl Hakano. Um, I, is that canon? Is it canon that Hakano is actually supposed to be a chick? <laughs> Uh, see, I don't know because I'm pretty sure the manga uses the female one. Of course, the the anime uses the male one, which I think was a mistake. I and I, I don't like well, how like actually, they made them two separate people. That like where the, if I remember correctly, it's not that they're two separate people. It's actually that uh, given the way they present the first episode of Last Encore to us, we get to see the previous cycle where Nero is defeated, and we see the female version of Hakano. But then during the next cycle, Hakuno is reincarnated into the male counterpart. So they do acknowledge and include both variants. So it's like both. Because it's all inside a computer a computer system, it doesn't really affect things on the whole. Kind of like how Grand Order, in all the serious works, they decide to go with the male version of Fujimaru. Whereas in the comedy stuff, like uh, Fate Grand Carnival and the Learning with Manga uh, subseries, they go with the, with the female version. Yeah. So yeah, it's, just, it's like two it's opposite here. So Hakano can be both if you want to take Last Encore and give it any kind of credibility. Yeah, I I just I thought that was a mistake. I thought they should have gone with the female version for the entire thing. But I'll also say that I mean, if you want to say that like Extella's like harem type situation is a you know male gaze indulgent. Um, escapist fantasy kind of situation you can say that but that's more of a deeper criticism about anime as a as a whole and anime style video games as a whole and it's not a criticism that i'm above making because it's actually the same reason why it was so hard on grand order is because grand orders um like the the you know wailing for your waifu kind of thing is is all the unnecessary yeah it's i mean Sorry the first time, maybe the fifth, but when, when you present lowly Paul Bunyan to me, we're about to fight. We are about to fist fight, my friend. <laughs> it's more of, it's more of, I just think it's, um, again, I'm, pro- I'm projecting my own values onto another culture's values, which is maybe not, not right. But it's like, I think we're reinforcing a, a cultural coping mechanism that is not healthy. Um, right. But I think that Extella would just having like, a bunch of girls around you is not nearly as as bad as uh, you know spending a bunch of money trying to get your your wife or whatever. Yeah, I, I can definitely get behind that. Um, it, it's actually a joke I made in at least two of my videos about how much money I spent to get uh, Mysterious Hero and X Alter, uh, who is basically Saber cosplaying as Darth Maul yeah. in Fate Grand Order. I, I've actually made that joke at least twice on my channel. Uh, and I, I, I haven't even tallied up how much I actually sank on it. Like, I don't wail often. That's one that I wailed for. Because, I mean, it's it's Saber with a double blade of red lightsaber. You think I'm not going to? But, right. um, uh, I had another plot, I had another conversation thread, and I, I lost it. What was it? it was... Well, real, real quick, uh, Eric is saying that in the Foxtail manga, Hakuno is male. Um, but, um... From a from a diegetic standpoint, Hakuno could potentially be male or female. It doesn't really matter. Um, right. Oh, oh Brie also uh, said I, earlier that uh, Rin is the best fate waifu, which I I, I guess I I agree with. Um, it, I, she's the one where it's like. I, go ahead. As much as I adore Saber, uh, I I gotta admit, at least when it comes to who do I want to pair Shiro with, it's got to be Rin. Which yeah. I think we've had the conversation before. We we I have, 
I have pros and cons for each of the three main, uh, for each of the three main love interests in Fate Stay Night. Which actually, th that's a nice segue. I, I remember my my plot thread over here. A lot of people will say that Fate is a harem anime or manga, or not manga, but a harem series like Fate Stay Night is. Do you agree with that, or, or do you disagree? Um, so I remember, I remember like way back in the early days, and I mentioned this in my Dean reviews where I, somebody was like oh yeah it's it's part of the harem genre i'm like i don't i don't really think so i mean I, it's if you just look at the fact that um shiro lives in a house where he ends up having a bunch of girls live there like it's not really that many well i guess i guess three or yeah it's like what at most th four five girls end up live with him i guess that is kind of a lot i shouldn't say oh it's not that many girls you just live with four girls whatever but um um but uh um it just takes up such a small part of the story and the fact yeah. that like the fact that they spend an entire route with a dedicated romance to one character i feel like is is it's hard to consider it a harem when like it's more it's closer to like any one of those that are dating sim type of games or like the Oto, otome games where it's like you you have just a variety of options of who to pick but you pick somebody you pick them for sure and you go all the you way with it yeah as opposed to when i think of when i think of harem i think of um don't say sword art online no i was gonna i was gonna go way worse i was gonna go with love hina or uh, uh oh, what was that one? Oh, uh i can't remember it, it's an old one uh ben at the sage did a video on it um yeah, I love Hina. Well, that, that, that's not the one I'm thinking about. It's, it's a different one. Uh, but Bennett it's hates not Kona that Suba. series. I know it's not Kona Suba. I know it's not Kona Suba. Um, that, that one's way way too recent. Um, crap. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, I'll, I'll remember it later. But, um, but like, uh, I have the exact same point of view to where, yes, there are technically multiple options, but when you get with one on the route, you commit so that's why I don't think that it counts as a harem because Shiro dedicates to that one for for the entire entirety <clears throat> of it. I want to say uh, I will pose the counter argument that if you want to say any of them could potentially be presented as a harem route, I would actually say the fate route in all fairness because he starts off Sakura is at his house a lot, but then he gets with Saber, but then Saber returns to the Throne of Heroes and then at least going by how the Dean anime ends things off, it heavily implies that he and Rin are going to get together because of everything they've been through. So I would say if any of them are a harem route, potentially, is the fate one. But the other two, not even in the slightest, because there's, like, next to no romance between Shiro and Saber in Unlimited Blade Works, and Heaven's Feel, he is 3,000% dedicated to Sakura to the point to where he literally throws his entire ideology in the trash to sacrifice his whole dream of being a hero of justice just to protect her. Yeah, I think the so, other thing is the other thing too is like you can have elements of a genre in your story and it doesn't necessarily have to go all the way and occupy that genre because you would never describe Fate Stay Night as a romance story. It can have a no. romance in it and it doesn't have to be part of that genre because there's just so much going on in the story that like the actual romance aspects of it take up like what 10 50, like 5 10% of the entire runtime of the story um if that uh, uh, <laughs> eric says that the uh sunny day extra ending for unlimited blade works is rin gets a harem i actually i think that's fair because at that point rin uh her contract is literally keeping saber anchored to the world and uh, shiro's got nothing after this so yeah rin wins rin is the ultimate winner of that <laughs> yeah yeah no for real i mean it's it's rin's uh Rin's bisexual polyamorous three way, which is like everything you could want, I guess. Um, I, I made another that. one, like, I don't want to go too far off on a tangent with this next one, but one that a lot of people like to say is a harem is sword art online. I will fight people on this one. Kirito is completely dedicated to Asuna, and if the other chicks are falling for him, that's on them, not him. So, no, not a harem. I will fight people on that. Yeah, but, uh, I. I only watched the first series of SAO, and then I watched the um, uh, the the, se the second Gun Gale series. Like not Gun Gale Online itself, but the second offshoot where Kirito is not the main character. No, I watched the the uh, movie. 
the um, oh yeah, orbital scale. Yes, something like yes, that. that's the one. Um, that was that was fun. That was a, that was a decent movie. Um, anyway, um, I love the the joke I made in the in the Excel Part Two video where like when I as for as soon as I say oh harem route. Uh, Michelle who's watching it with me she's like she kind of like laughs and she's like yeah you end up with two wives and a child at the end of this and I was like yeah, yeah I, I, mean, I, I have a I, line I, saved up for that later <laughs> that uh that definitely got a, a really good chuckle out of me too like I'm like oh yep I, I suppose it is because now you get all three wives who's uh, uh joining forces to fight the to fight our committees <laughs> yeah and, and that my I love that like after everything of this game has been about the line I choose to go out on is yeah our, our our big gay polyamorous trio and their adopted child. <laughs> um, wonderful. Just wonderful. Um, so I have... Here's something that I cut from the video that this actually was... It was in the script. I filmed it. It was actually in the video and I cut it on the actual cutting room floor at the last minute. And I cut it because yeah. I, I was... I was obsessing over it a little too much, and I was like, ooh, I don't know if I like this. I'm going to send you the actual um, uh, thing real quick here. All right. So uh, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I had this rant. So, okay. Because they chose to date the invasion of Sefer as 14,000 years ago, um, immediately my my brain starts like going to the um the end of the ice age and all yeah. of the alternate alternate theories and science about what caused the end of the ice age and yeah. there are there's a theory it was scrat and that acorn obviously yeah yeah, yeah totally that, um but <laughs> there is a there's a theory in i guess you could say it's it's alternative science i i hate even saying that it's a theory that is not um, recognized as a scientific theory, but it is. Um, where did I save this ad? Here we go. Um, so you can see it's actually I actually have the clip in the uh, the render queue and everything, and um, so I'm talking about this comet impact theory and how like people believe that there was a comet that impacted North America. And it like shattered the ice shelf mm -hmm. and started like rapid melting and it killed off all the different species of uh, megafauna in North America and and wiped out a bunch of um, civilizations and all that. And that was, you know, a, a, a global catastrophic event. Um, and they date that event around 11,600 years ago to 12,000 years ago. And that almost lines up with what Nasu is trying to tell us about Sefer and... Uh, so, like, in the context of fate, the invasion of Sefer onto the Earth and the extermination of those those um, Ice Age era, um, Neolithic, Paleolithic um, cultures is the uh, Nasuverse canon version of the end of the Ice Age, more or less. But when I was describing this combat impact theory, I was like, Ice must sound like a maniac right now. And so I, I cut it because it just sounded so ridiculous. And like, if, if you look at my little disclaimer I have on the screen there, when I put that disclaimer in there and I said, yeah, based on analysis of climate change graphs and glacial ice layers, still speculation and not recognized as scientific theory. I was like, the fact that I even have to put this in here probably means I need to cut this out of the video. <laughs> so, um, it's one of those things that's where you got you got to wonder if people will get that your joke is in fact a joke, or will they actually will they actually think you're serious? Yeah, so I I was like, um, well, it's not so much whether or not they would recognize it as a joke. It's more so. Um, you're trying to get the chat pulled back up again. Here we go. Um, it's more so. This is just too ridiculous and too much of a of a uh, divergence from the main story to include this in here so I, I i just cut it all together i said this is yeah. i i like the idea because like i was there's been some podcasts about it and i think the guys that talk about it are really cool blah 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 and um but at the end of the day i was like okay this this needs to be cut but on that same note um there was a line that archimedes says uh he technically says it twice but he says it um technically in the same scene but just through different two different um 
Hakuno's perspectives. Um, and right. so he he sees he he sees the White Titan suffer, and he's like he's like just as the uh, the stone monument of Altamira uh, pr- prophesized, and you're just like, well, what is what is that? What is the stone monument of Altamira? So I Google it because I'm like, is this some kind of like fate lore thing? Um, turns out what it is is the um the there's a cave it's like the cave of of altamira or something like that that is um it's a real real place that actually exists and it is a it's not a megalithic site it's like a paleolithic site where they have um the cave paintings and if yeah, you remember like at the a, very, 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 very beginning yeah, of Extella, you see the White Titan on the cave paintings with like the buffalo and all that stuff. You remember that? Yeah, yeah, at the very beginning. That's what he's talking about. And I thought that was a cool little reference. So again, the uh, some of those um, some of those cave paintings are actually much, much, much older than the um, than the. Um, the Younger Dryas period, the end of the Ice Age, uh, end of the Ice Age, and much much older than the arrival when they would have dated the arrival of Sefer in the Nasuverse, But um, they are not. Um, again, it's it's in this alternate timeline thing. If we're not immune to going back and just adding this in as as a detail to our little um, our little continuity there. Um, are you caught up on uh, Grand Order Lost Belts? Like, do you know what's going on in the Lost Belt storylines? Not in the Japanese version. In the North American version, we're about to start the uh, Greek Lost Belts. I haven't really. I know. Th- I know that uh, Avalon Avalon was uh, the most recent one to get released in the Japanese version. That's the last one I kept up with. But I don't know anything about the story because I like to experience it as it happens. You know. Or okay, at least that, when I can get it. So. Yeah, that was a that was something that just came to me. I I wanted to make sure that me mentioning the um Lost Belt storylines when explaining the whole Sefer thing didn't blindside you. Um I'm okay with that because that actually makes me excited to get to it because I I love The Legend of King Arthur. I love Arthurian lore. That that's actually why I latched on to Saber so quickly. I'm like I, like I'm like this back uh I'm trying to remember well, anyway, I was like I was thinking to myself King Arthur, but it's a waifu. Yes, please. Like yeah, when I first I just... watched Phase Zero, that's that that's just my first immediate thought. Right. I um I just thought it was crazy to learn that like that event, the arrival of Sephir on Earth, is like the singular moment that like defines the, the timeline of like all of fate. Because um if things don't happen a particular way in that moment, history has changed forever. Cause you either, you either let her destroy like most of the world before you blow her away with Excalibur or you, or you doom the timeline forever. Like it's like they, um, you let her get too far and then there's nothing left on earth at all. Or you, uh, stop her too early and the gods still exist. And then they, they, um, they don't want to give up their power and so on, but um, butterfly effects literally changing the tiniest thing alters the entire course of history. Yeah. Um. So there was a uh, this is this one doesn't take as much time to explain. It's just really funny. So if if you go back and watch part one, uh, at the end of Tamamo's first mission, when Nero shows up, the camera is on. Hakano and Tamamo and it zooms out to show Nero and the cutscene is actually glitched out where Tamamo is inside of a pillar nearby and <laughs> I kept that in because I didn't obviously I'm not gonna have, like re-record that one cutscene or anything but I was like oh the uh yeah the cutscenes glitched out That's um Bree says 2015 2015 in regards to what uh, in regards to when I first watched Phase Zero, like oh, th- that's okay. correct. It, it would it would it would have been then. I was I was trying to remember. I was trying to remember the, the exact year it was, but but yes, that's uh that's correct. Twenty fifteen. Okay. Um. So here's something else that um I didn't want to unpack this in the game and in, in the video because I didn't know um 
I didn't fully know what was going on here. So from what I um, from what I read up, because I was reading up on Sefer and about uh, Velber, the Umbral Star, and that kind of thing. And apparently, um, Sefer is what's called an anti cell. We know that, but apparently there are three anti cells, and she is one of three. And so the question is, what are the other two? And are they, is it established in any fate continuity what they are? Um, If you watch the opening of that OP of of Extella again, you'll notice, you'll actually see before the little establishing shot of Altera, where she does the little hair flip thing, um, you'll see um, Velber flying over and dropping the three objects out of it, which I think is the three anti-cells, but we just don't know what they are yet. Um, so is there, is there going to be a Fate Extella 3? I sure hope so. I mean, we didn't make that Studio BB for nothing, right? But, um... Right. So, um... Yeah. And I, I also... I still have Fate Extella Link. I, I still have the limited edition of Fate Extella Link shrink-wrapped on my bookshelf because I haven't finished Extella 1 yet, so I haven't opened Extella 2. <laughs> yeah. Um, we will get to that in due time as well. Um, I have some very strong feelings about that, but I'm looking forward to playing it again. Um, is, it a, is it Charlemagne playable in this one? Yes. I remember you telling me a long time ago, and one of the biggest hangups you have with Apocrypha is how they portray Astolfo. You've always loved the Paladins of Charlemagne. So yeah. I, I'm really interested to see your take on both Apocrypha and this. Like that's, uh, that I'm, really, I'm extremely looking forward to that, and I'm very much, very, very, absolutely very much looking forward to the Heavensfield trilogy because I got a lot of thoughts about that too. Um, but of course, you know, all, all, all in good time, uh, gotta, gotta get through the other, other routes first, but yes, heavens feel whenever you get, you get to those in the foreseeable future. I am, I'm here for that. I am absolutely here for that. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm actually way more excited to talk about the heavens feel movies than any of the other fate works that came out after Extella because, um, it's incredible. I feel, well, yes, but I also feel very underprepared to talk about, apocrypha even now and the problem is like i have the blu-ray for season one so technically i can watch it and like get a script ready but um because avani is one of my absolute best friends and she's like a hard hardcore mordred kin um yeah has read the apocrypha light novel has read the apocrypha manga was reading it like as it was being translated like was was very much into it I feel like I robbed myself of a good opportunity to kind of prepare myself for what was going to happen in that story. And so um, I don't have the context of knowing how good or poor an adaptation Apocrypha really is. Because from what she tells me and some some other people tell me, the um, Apocrypha was not a good adaptation. So that's... Uh, that's why with a lot of the stuff that I go into, this is kind of uh, stemming off from one criticism you've given about my Fate Zero videos in particular, is uh, you, you say that I focus on certain things that are important to me, whereas you feel that I should have given more attention to certain tiny, or maybe not tiny, but certain other specific uh, details and aspects. It's one of those things of... Unless I know the source material going in, I'm trying to judge it on its merit as... Uh, a standalone and seeing how it fares up. How is it as a final product without it riding the wave of uh, the the precursor? Because you know, I didn't read the uh, I didn't read the Fate uh, Zero light novel, and I, I didn't know Fate Stay Night existed before watching Fate Zero, so I had nothing to compare it to based on my first experience. And then that's kind of the I try to carry that genuine reaction authenticity with me into my videos. Like you saw that that full rage breakdown I had when. Uh, the fight with Gilgamesh and Ryder ended. Yeah. <laughs> like that, that actually was pretty close to being my genuine, authentic reaction my first time watching it. Like, I I was extremely angry. So I, I'm trying to carry that uh, air of authenticity with it. And I will say this one thing that both you and Bria pointed out with uh, some of my videos is when doing these reviews, I will often give a blind audience reaction. It's obviously staged because I've watched it before. But at the same time, I'm also like, remember this for later. Remember, remember that for later. I'm going to bring it back up. And it's like, it's kind of confusing. It's like, do you know what's going to happen or do you not? Is this a reaction or are you, are, are, do you already know what's coming? So it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of wishy-washy and that can kind of take you out of the experience a little bit. But it, uh, 
circling back around to the point I'm making, a lot of times I think it's okay to just judge it as a standalone. Like, uh, let's take The Hobbit, the the, the movies of uh, Middle Earth. If like based on what little I know about the book, because I, I played the the PS2 game and I watched like the really old cartoon version. Oh of the movie, yeah, which, <laughs> those adapted those adapted the book way better than the live action movies did. Because I'm not a big reader, like reading just doesn't doesn't appeal to me very much. Like reading books and novels and all that. But based on what I did know, it wasn't a good adaptation. It's a very entertaining movie, just not a good adaptation. So it, I think it's 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 okay to judge things as a standalone and as an adaptation. Yeah, like, I guess you can take it both different ways. Yeah, I guess my approach. Um, so I so I I totally I totally agree because. First of all, I catch myself doing the exact same thing where I kind of uh, I kind of go interchangeably between like kind of perform performing a reaction to what I'm seeing and then also guiding the but audience through it more or less. So I do I do this exact this exact same thing um, to where it's like um I think where, maybe where you get stuck is you establish at the beginning sometimes that it's like from a from the narrative of your video, it's your first impression when we know that's not true. Um, yeah. But um, but I'll, just as an example, like with the Excel video, I um, I said like with reacting to Tamamo's demise in the Dawn arc, I was like, oh god, I can't believe they did they killed her. Like I was like trying to act shocked or whatever, but I'm like. Obviously, uh, I would know that because I said at the beginning of this video that I love this game and that I've played it a million times. So why would I not know that? You know, it's or, it's a your uh, your your reaction to uh, Medusa's death in uh, Limited Blade works. Yeah, 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 exactly. So <laughs> that, that 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 still gets kicked out of me. Oh God, they twisted her head around like an owl. Yeah, just, all the cracking sounds as her neck twists back. <laughs> yeah, need, lead, needlessly graphic and over the top. Um, so I think I think that's no. fine. Uh, it's kind of like, um. You know, do you want there to be a fourth wall in the video or do you want it to be this performative thing is kind of the the, the question there. But because um, beyond the that, it's is just pref the preferential. The fourth wall is made to be broken. The fourth wall is made to be broken. Well, <laughs> more it's more so that there's... Um, it's more so that with the online video format, there's n really no rules you can yeah. kind of decide whatever format you want to go with. And um, editing shortcuts can completely disguise um, any any existence of a fourth wall by, you know, cutting around stuff. And, but anyway, um, so um, I guess I, I guess I totally agree with your with your point there about just analyzing something on its um, isolated you know, as a standalone work. And I, I mentioned earlier when I was streaming doom, this is before you jumped in. I was like, I can't help this feeling of imposter syndrome. When I talk about what a big fan I am of doom and its software, because I know that I'm like, I'm too young to have to be nostalgic for doom because it came out the year I was born. So obviously I can't have played it as a kid. You know, I, I, I never played it in the DOS era. I never played on windows 95. I didn't play it with keyboard controls. First time I played it was on the damn Xbox. And so hey, first time I played final fantasy was the original final fantasy one and two remaster on game boy advance. So you can definitely get nostalgic about things. Yeah. Uh, it's I, also, I don't think that well, it's also like, we're both, we're both memories, Gundam fans too. And it's that. like, you know, it's not like we were around to watch the original Gundam in 1979, right? <laughs> no, of course not. But, uh, um, you know, heck, my, one of my other favorite uh, game series, Mega Man X, it technically debuted in 1993. And guess who was born in 93? Mm -hmm. This guy. So yeah. you might say X and I grew up together. So, but, uh, yeah. so, um, but you know, I, it's it, this. This also doesn't really have an age as long as it brings back pleasant memories of a very nice time. Uh, that's, you know, it just is what it is. Like, heck, the, uh, I didn't get into Pokemon until until uh, Heart Gold Soul Silver, and then the uh, the Brilliant uh, Pearl, uh, no Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl remakes just came out. And playing it again after playing Platinum, after playing Heart Gold, it's making me super nostalgic for you know like ten years ago. Which that's yeah, you know, I, I think that's perfectly fine. Just brings back happy memories. But I guess what I'm saying is more so that. Um... 
there's you, there shouldn't have to be you know an arbitrary qualification to be able to talk about something like i don't want to gatekeep myself from being able to talk about doom if i like doom but it's like yeah well, you Other... also don't have to be an expert at everything that you do and say. Like, I get that sometimes as uh, online content creators, especially if you want to make a review of a game, you feel that you need to uh, study up on it a lot. That's that's one thing that I, I have uh, one unfortunate problem I've run across is I got countless games on my bookshelf over here that I definitely want to do a video, video review, live stream, let's play, whatever. And uh, I haven't yet because it's like, I, or I have, haven't played it on its own because I'm like I want to I want to do a video on that so I want to wait till I can actually have a good raw reaction so I, I haven't really played them despite collecting them for over five six years at this point yeah I've done so, I've done the same thing as well but I, I guess it's exactly to your point it's like sometimes I feel like somebody's like you don't have to have certain credentials to make a video on something but the um the knowledge or like the brand that they sell when they talk about it should be self-evident, I guess. And it's like, um, you should be so able like to the guy... the passion and that should be enough. Yeah. Well, like the guy, the guy who I, I send you, I sent, I sent you a couple of his videos, Dan Olson, whose videos I've been watching, yeah. who's been a big inspiration for some of my style lately. Um, you, he's worked in the film industry. Like he knows, he's no, he knows what editing is. He knows what scene structure is. He knows how, how productions work from a from a time standpoint how you how you schedule shoot days how, um budgetary restraints like he he knows all that stuff and it's self evident that he knows that stuff because of how he talks about it um i guess the only parallel i can i can make to something like that is like when i talk about fate i can say well i, I was there when when all of these things came out and um the context of how each one came out and and evolved the consensus of the series as a whole was like this organic evolution over time and i was just i was just there to experience it and um so i guess my to kind of come back full circle my thing about apocrypha is that i do want to talk about it. i do want to make a video about apocrypha eventually but i think i need to at least um either read up on the light novel and the manga or get some, get some consensus from some other fans as to um, adaptational changes that didn't work. Uh, Cause I actually did right. this research before getting ready for unlimited blade works, believe it or not. I, I asked a bunch of people in various different circles. I said, what about unlimited blade works? The series worked or didn't work as an adaptation Um to you. And then I also watched other people's videos on it. I watched the whole thing about Shiro being like a trauma survivor and how that's an important theme to Unlimited Blade Works. Somebody made an entire video essay about just that. And so I was like, okay, well that must be very important and I must I have to mention I have to mention that if it's that important for somebody to make an entire video just on um on um his trauma and his 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 personification um so i'll probably just have to do that same amount of research for um apocrypha to make sure i i know what the consensus is of other people before i start talking about certain things and say well some people say that this didn't work i kind of feel differently about it or you know stuff like that yes yeah i was about to say uh I was about to say, it's okay to get a general consensus, but you definitely need to put in your own thoughts and feelings as well. Because if you're just going to agree with the masses, then what's the point? Yeah. I mean, unless you genuinely <laughs> feel that. Yeah, if we did that, we wouldn't have such uh, pleasant things to say about Dean, right? <laughs> right. I, I, I like Dean. I, I really like the, the Fate Stay Night Adaptation Studio, Dean. I really do. I do too, and it actually bothers me how, like, now that Heaven's Feels completely done, everybody's like, when's Euphotable going to make the Fate route? And I'm like, Honestly, it doesn't need it. Like, I'm sick of people saying that it needs it. It really doesn't. Like, there is a solid Fate Stay Night, like, Fate Route anime that you can go watch. It's fine. Um, you know, the only thing, I would, only thing I would do is if they do decide to redo it, I'll just say, heavens feel it, make it three movies. And the only reason I would say that they should do it, besides just more money, is uh, accessibility. Just because a lot of times older anime like this is getting harder to come across. 
and yet somehow this older stuff is actually more affordable than the current Fate properties because you're going to drop $150 for a 13-episode Apocrypha Season 1 or a full series of Fate Extra Last Encore. So, Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a licensing that trend, thing, though, too, like with Aniplex and that all that. That trend needs to die. I, I don't want to spend literally like half of a week's paycheck trying to get an anime series. I can't afford that. Yeah. The budget doesn't allow that. <laughs> yeah, although I actually I struck gold on a... Uh, the only thing I bought for Black Friday was on rightstuff.com. They had the um, complete season two Blu-ray for uh, Blood Blockade, which is the final uh, Yasuhiro Naitao anime that I'll have to review. Um, and it was normally like a $60 Blu-ray, and they had it for like 25 And I was like, hot damn, I'll take that. <laughs> There you so, go. I would definitely, I would definitely love to see uh, the Fate Route re- revitalized, uh, especially if we can get Kari Walgren voicing Saber. The problem I'm having is Bryce Pappenbrook as Shira, which no disrespect to Bryce Pappenbrook, but I can almost always tell it's him, first word out of his mouth. Yeah. Uh, or uh, h- here's one. Here's one. Uh, uh, what, what's the name of that Bryce Pappenbrook character that yells too much and dual wields swords? Yeah, <laughs> it's like which one. <laughs> Um, yeah, there's, at there, least there's three four at least off the top of your head. Yeah, at, at least there's four. If there's four, there's Shiro Emiya, uh, Kirito, Aaron Yeager, and uh, Inosuke from Demon Slayer. Oh, I didn't know. Okay, yeah, I don't know anything about the English yep. dub for Demon Slayer actually. I gotta admit, um, that's actually probably my my favorite role he's done so far, just because Inosuke is so hilariously stupid and it's it's awesome. I love it. Yeah. Um, uh, he did actually do a decent job as Caesar Zeppeli in JoJo uh, because his hilariously cheesy Italian accent masked the fact that it's still Kirito under there. So it actually took me a little bit to recognize. Wait a minute, I know you. So I've, I've heard got... that that edgy anime voice scream somewhere before. Yeah, I've got two quick little points to make about Extella, and then we can go completely unhinged if you want. Um, right. Yeah. So. Uh... I mentioned the um, the three anti cells thing. Where also what I what I learned when I read up on this is that um, apparently oh. I don't know if this is something that was lost in translation with Extella, but you know how um, Alter- Altera's color scheme is like tricolor, where she has like the the green, blue, red on her crown thing and on parts of her clothing and even as part of her sword. Yeah, the sword of Mars. Yeah. Well, evidently, from what I read, somebody said that the the three colors are meant to represent her three different personalities, and that hmm. she the the different ways in which we see her behave in the game are three separate personalities that um, manifest as a different kind of like the um, uh, what is the, the is it the Quintessons from Transformers where it's the spinning head and it's like suddenly a different voice, innocent, yes, yeah. Quintessons. Yeah, 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 and also, did you notice that uh, each of the uh, three colors of Hakano corresponded to the colors on the sword, red, blue, and green? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, but I haven't... So, so I that's don't... one thing I was going to say. If uh, maybe the other two of the, uh, what are they called, anti-cells, maybe those two are alternate versions of Altera. Like, they're all, like, one big giant entity that has been split into three d- <clears throat> different entities, kind of like Hakano was. Probably not, but maybe... That would be interesting. I mean, they would they would probably have the same appearance as her because they are they come they they they're both like white blobs essentially. But um, so I don't know how valid that is the the tricolor personality thing. Um, because I think there there are solid reasons for why her her behavior changes that the game ex- does a fine job of explaining. The only thing that didn't really sit right with me is when you wake up in the morning on the final day and she's just like, you're nothing more than a pest. I could eat you right now and you wouldn't be able to stop me. And it's like, and, and I'm just like, okay, that was terrifying. But also like, some I'm sure that's somebody's fetish, so you may want to stop while you're ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I was actually going to say, I made the joke during my uh, Prilia 3 ride review that uh, I, I've joked before that uh, Prilia likes to do what it, it, is someone else's fetish, like Loliism is one. Uh, two of them that they brought in three, right? Or three of them actually. Uh, don't ask me how I know these because I've been on the internet for a long time. But DeviantArt fetishes—you got people 
in three where I gain turn into stuffed animals. You got hypnotized maids, and then now uh, in Phase Stella we got giantesses, and I'm like, yep, they're really pandering to the DVR fetishist, fetishists on this one. Yeah, I think I think <laughs> at one point I had I had the idea to include like the um, giantess thing in the script as like because I mentioned I'm like they're going for a very particular brand of fan service with this, and I meant I meant to I, say I that. that that was popular around when this game came out. Because right around the same time that game came out is when we had, like, Deanne from Seven Deadly Sins and, like, Mount Lady from Hero Academia that were all, like, giants. And I'm like... Yeah. Somebody is... Uh, uh, it's like, I don't know what they're well, doing, but I know they're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So uh, the last point as well. Uh, this this got a good laugh out of out of Michelle where um how elizabeth breaks altera out of the like titan altera out of the prison at the very end troublemaker through and through like the out of nowhere left field wild card that it's like okay well she's been oddly quiet for the majority of this route where is she oh that's where you're at (laughs) yeah like the last the last two times that she shows up the one time where i'm just like screaming no and then the other time where she shows up right after a scanner gets um ko'd um yeah i was i was i forgot that she was going to appear i legitimately legitimately forgot and i was like oh shit here we go and so like the game paced that perfectly but yeah that final moment where um so i said in the script i was i was like yeah elizabeth just lets her out just to see what would happen which is not technically true and i wanted to explain that here because um, she doesn't just let her out just to see what would happen. I said that because it's funny, but in reality, um, I cut around this in the dialogue. So it's not like you're reading something in the dialogue and you're like, well, wait a minute, that's not what's happening. But if you, if you got to read the whole dialogue in that scene unedited, you would see that Elizabeth is saying she wants to take her powers from her by like vampirically, like biting her or whatever. And she's like, oh, let me just get these off of you. Now, where should I bite her? I could bite her anywhere and she wouldn't be able to stop me. And then um, Altera is just like, squeak. And so that's actually what happens. But uh, I just thought it was funnier to say, yeah, she lets her out just to fuck with Archimedes. And I was about to say, you know, even like, even though like you had to, she had to know going in that, that it wasn't going to work right because literal giantess over there and I agree with you, Archimedes' expression at the very end, because you know the entire time he and Elizabeth have been kind of sort of working together, even though Elizabeth is is rogue, and he's over here like, "You idiot, you messed it up again." Yeah, so you're, like you're breaking the time line every single time. So uh, funny thing about that. Well, r- real quick, Eric says that there was definitely some moments with Giantess Altera that definitely felt like the writer was working through some things. I'm like, yeah. yeah. That's true. Um, I cut out a lot of the very fan servicey moments with her, where like you get to like Thanks. crawl around on her body and stuff, and yeah, it gets it gets yeah. weird. Um, uh, but uh, okay, so if you've pl- if you've played Archimedes' side story, you get to see how Archimedes um, got corrupted, how he um, first found Sephir, and how he uh, recruited recruited elizabeth to the side of the umbral star and it's just funny to me because it's like he, he's running around like a maniac and he's like you you'll do nicely and it's like uh you know like a cartoon where like she makes a squeaky noise when he picks her up like squeak and just like there there she is and then <laughs> just he, she just continues to undermine everything he does from that moment onward and he just regrets everything um, also, side note about that, um, from a from a like high concept standpoint, like picking somebody to be a servant in Fate, I thought that um, Archimedes was a great choice. I really like Archimedes as a character. I think his design is cool too. It's just a shame that he's he's kind of a puppet to the Umbral Star because in Excel Link, he doesn't really do a whole lot. But um, hey, but. Fake Grand Order someday, please give us Archimedes. Yeah, he he and Charlemagne are still not in Grand Order all these years later. But um, the, Charlemagne uh, definitely should be because you know, Roland has made an appearance 
as an NPC, but never as a fightable or summonable servant. He's always... Like, Fate Grand Order loves to do this thing where they have portrait art of uh, a well-known historical figure as a servant, and then they're like, well, but for this for this battle, I'm going to assume the form of this random ghost because I can't fully materialize. And I'm like, that's such a cop-out. Yeah, that's Come on. Lame. But, um... Yeah. But... It makes me want to see other, like inventors and um people like that as servants because we have we have edison we have for your lion head we have tesla right yes tesla okay now i have a love-hate relationship with tesla because it, it's like on the one hand he's really cool i love his design i love his style i love how he fights why is he an archer why is he an archer he gave me so much trouble <laughs> during the London chat, because I'm all about the sabers. He's over here, yeah, I got lightning. I'm like, oh, so you're a caster, right? No, I'm an archer. What? Yeah. Every, every, um, everything died. The one that I really want to see is Galileo. I think that Galileo would be a fascinating servant to see. Um, and, and make his noble phantasm uh, super noble, like Sephiroth in Final Fantasy VII. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. Um, I actually had a, a concept for a Galileo servant uh thought up for a uh a role play fanfic thing we were writing a long time ago um but uh it didn't really take off but i still have the idea in the back of my head so um okay so that's all my notes about excella um that's everything i wanted to cover about that um again the video is a massive undertaking to put together but i had a really great time making it and i'm um super grateful that people have decided to sit through nearly three hours of content <laughs> so i will um, say that out of a lot of different video game reviews that I've watched over the years and have even written and recorded and uploaded some myself, I definitely like the style you went for here. Like I said, it, it's uh, it, kind of like a dynamic narrator. Like, you ever you ever play Bas uh, Bastion? Um, no, but I'm familiar with it. I've seen I've seen speedruns of it. Well, yeah, it's like, you know, you got the dynamic narrator in the background who is uh, telling us what's going on as the player acts to it. You, you're kind of, like, guiding us along with it, and it, it's a very pleasant experience, because, like I told you before, I think you have a very good narration voice. Uh, so it, it's not exactly just like a, hey, here's the game, here are, like, two parts about it, here, it's like, it's a theatrical thing, and even though, I'm not going to say it doesn't take a lot of work in editing, because that, that's definitely not fair or true, uh, but it's different, it's a different beast altogether than than uh doing an anime or movie review because there's you know it's it's a uh it's a an interactive experience to where you're like this is what i experienced as the player and i'm going to show you how how it is here and i'm going to walk you through it what i think is good what i think is bad etc and it, you did a very good job with this it's uh it, it's it's very different from the ones that i usually try to come up with and different than the ones that I have seen before that were the inspiration for my templates that I use. So I, I definitely really enjoyed it. Yeah. I, um, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty proud of it. Um, I like the narration overall, but I was, I was really worried that with it going on so long, the narration would get stale, especially with how many times I have to repeat like the same character's name or something like that. I think I used the phrase like save Altera like 20 times in the last route or something like that. But, um, but you, you, you just hear the, uh, save the world theme from Undertale start playing in the background. Do yeah. Yeah. Do do. But, um, there was also like, I won't lie. There was a couple of sessions of editing with doing the voiceover for part two, where I was like, I need to stop because I sound so fatigued right now that the narration is just garbage. And so, and there was also times where, especially if I was trying to record in the evening after work, where I was just like, oh man, I feel awful. <laughs> and so I was like, I can't read the script fast enough and keep the inflection going and end up doing a million takes for the same line. And I was like, I just need to stop. So, uh, yeah. yesterday, like blitzing through it, really finishing it, um, is, was, um, what felt good because I did it in the morning. I had, you know, a fresh thing of coffee and I was ready to go and I was like, all right, we're going to bang out this last like 10, 15 minutes of the script and it, it went pretty well. Um, but, uh, yeah, what, um, I appreciate your assessment what um what else do you have what do you want to do you want to talk about the fate zero video a little bit well uh do you have any specific questions that you'd like to 
like to ask that you didn't already cover in your little reaction video things? Um, probably. Uh, I will say, um, uh, while you're thinking on, on those, uh, I will say Fate Zero Season 2, looking at it in retrospect, there are definitely some spots that I don't feel like I gave enough attention to. Not necessarily from a story standpoint, but I feel like that... I know we we don't really always like to split videos into two-parters, but it's also a matter of you got to think about audience retention uh, because that's just how the YouTube algorithm is. Uh, you know, if a video is too long, audience ain't going to stick around. But uh, a couple of moments during Fate Zero Season 2 specifically that I felt that I didn't give enough time to was actually the Kirinsky flashback episodes, especially the one with Natalia, because... Like, the, the second one, because we just go from, okay, we get Kiritsugu's motivation with uh, the tragedy of Shirley. We see how he gets with Natalia. We see why he's a mercenary. But then I just kind of just kind of sneeze the second episode at you. It's like, here's here's where they are now. Here's what they're doing. Here's what's going to happen. Here's what happens. We're done. I don't even tell you why we should be invested in this. It's just Kiritsugu's out and about. Why should we care about what happens to Natalia? Why, like, I had this big, overly dramatic no moment when he blows up the plane, but... I don't give you enough time to invest in Natalia as a character, like, in my review, specifically. Like, in the show, yeah, you can definitely see why this is this is a good thing, but if you're just watching my review and not the show itself, because, like, at some to a certain extent, sometimes I do present the show or movie as a thing of, you can watch this instead of watching... The show, like that's what I tried to approach the angle with for Prisma Ilya, because I'm like I don't, I wouldn't wish anyone to watch that except for the movie. <laughs> yeah, but but it's one of those things of this. I don't exactly want to entirely be a substitute, but if you don't care enough to seek out the original material, I should give you enough to go on. And I feel like that's where I really dropped the ball with this particular uh, video. The whole thing about I barely gave Natalia any screen time, and I barely gave her any dialogue or motivation, and I didn't really show you guys the, you know, the intense emotional moment at the very end when Kiritsugu just blows up the plane. I, I gave you next to nothing. So I feel like I dropped the ball hardcore right there. But well, again, the video was already, what, like 47 minutes long? Yeah, that's about, that's, that's about right. I'm actually looking at the time code right in front of me because the this backdrop right here is the video itself right here. Um, but... Um, <laughs> I wouldn't be so hard on yourself for that. And I guess I have, I don't have the best context because I, um, I skipped those episodes when I, um, did my fate zero video. And so I hadn't seen them in a while. So the clips of them that you showed were like, Oh, oh man, it's so cool to see this, uh, these scenes again. So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't notice what was cut because I didn't have that fresh, experience with those episodes like i had with the rest of the series um right i will say as well on that note that i love natalia uh, as a character i fucking love her and um it, i just i do like that you show like hiratsugu's complete little freak out because he's just so raw and that 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 meltdown is so believable and that mercer just sells that yeah, whole thing so well he really delivers. does a good job yeah. But um, I think I think what you could have done there is at least um, shared your thoughts on if whether or not that context makes you any more sympathetic towards him, because prior to that you you know was were pretty adamant that he was monstrous and had a you know essentially did a major betrayal of trust against um artoria Same. and it's like um does the context of where his his origin came from uh change any of that or does it does it does it make you uh c condemn him even more or um or forgive him some or just be like you know this is what happens when people go through shitty situations and don't get the right kind of help as they turn into they try to take justice in their into their own hands and become monstrous. I I kind I kind of see it as that last little bit you just said. It's uh it's one of those things of to where I get it, I sympathize with it, but I still hate it. Like I really wish there's an alternate outcome. It's like kind of a 
out of nowhere reference here. Did you ever play Castlevania Lords of Shadow? Um, I have it, but I haven't played it. Actually, the one I've been playing is Mirror of Fate on the 3DS. Uh, uh, so... you, you, uh, no, you you need to play you need to play Lords of Shadow one in the DLC to appreciate the story elements behind it. But as I'm sure uh, you you can pick up, the main character hardcore gets shafted in Lords of Shadow, and a lot of bad stuff happens to him. And you're like, it really sucks that this happened to him. But there seemed to be no other way. It seemed to be that the universe just said no. You in particular get crapped on. And that that's kind of the way I feel about Kiritsugu, which is he got in these positions and he did the best with what he knew how to do. It just so happened that that was really awful of him, but he had the best intentions out of it. So Yeah, it's like sucks for you, dude, but go to therapy. <laughs> right? Get some help, please. Yeah. Um Other than that, like I said, I, I um I don't know. I I think I think other than what I've already what I said in in the reaction video that I sent you, it was, um, it's just more of preferential things, and it's like what are you, what are the angle you're going for there? Because I I wanted to talk about zero from a, um, from my own personal experiences. You know, I, I watched it when it was here. We are more than a, a decade ago now. It aired ten years ago, and I, I remember watching it episode by episode as it was airing. And it was the first anime I'd ever done that for since the Toonami era. Um, cool. It was the first anime, like, as an adult that I watched episode by episode. And um, so I wanted to kind of, I wanted to convey those emotions as well. But it was also like, I recognize that a lot of people have talked about Zero since then. Because, because Zero is so heavy on theme, it is... Um, it's ripe for people who make like oh, so like are you familiar with like a uh, super eye patch wolf and people like that not familiar with them no i'm sorry okay i may send you some of his zero videos cuz he's like made little one off videos about like about like a one off video just about a scander that's like talking about the nature of greek tragedy and how like yeah these are great and and uh powerful heroes and they hold justice in the palm of their hand, but they fail anyway. Not because the story is trying to say that the villain needed to win, but because all of these heroes had a lesson to learn. They were, they needed to be humbled or they had too much hubris and they needed, um, they, they needed to, um, understand the error of their ways. And, and, um, you know, pe people like to focus in on stuff like that and like to unpack that stuff. And, um, I also think that, um, I had almost no choice to go this route when I talked about Zero, where, um, you kind of have to talk about the context of how it fits in with the rest of the story, the rest of the fate works, and you do this at the end. At the end of the video, you're like, well, this is a great standalone work, but it also, um, enhances the experience of the rest of the, of the series, which is correct, um, but it doesn't say anything about your um, how you feel about the re the reverse watch order. So, like, if somebody were to say, um, "Hey, st like hy hypothetically, if somebody were to say, hey, it is one hundred percent wrong to watch Zero first, watch Stay Night first, or if somebody were to say, hey, it is it is like it is one hundred percent wrong to watch to read Stay Night or to watch Stay Night first because because um, it's a, it's spoilers for Zero and you should watch Zero first. It's it's like um, you know, what is your actual opinion on that? And, um, I will say it depends on what kind of story you want to go for. It, it's like the comparison I used in the beginning of, uh, of part one was, uh, it's like the star Wars movie. Uh, I honestly think it is a lot like the star Wars movies to where you can pick and choose. Do you want to go with what was presented first to understand the original context and the original direction? Or do you want to go with what is first in the storyline? And, uh, I know you made the mention that, uh, uh, you you had actually gone to see Rogue One uh, with uh, Avani when she got done moving, and that that's a comparison you didn't necessarily particularly agree with because uh, Star Wars is a uh, more well known than Fate, so it's so integral into our society that a lot of the heavy plot elements like Darth Vader being Luke's father is common knowledge at this point. So choosing to watch them in any order at all wouldn't really impact anything because you kind of know going in just because of how common knowledge it is. Yeah, and I so, guess. 
that that's a so the analogy there is fine because if somebody i mean if you haven't had your experience with something ruined already then you have the opportunity to go in um however you want to also before i forget here um brie asked if i was going to be at comic con this year i want to go i currently don't have any plans on going but we'll see what happens because it's possible that a um a spot of vacation time may free up in january because um Typically, that's like the last part of the fiscal year people try to request vacation time off for. So I, I might try to make right. it for Comic Con. We'll see. But anyway, is a uh, is a uh, do you have a rate up banner going at that time? Can I summon you to the con? Oh, uh, I, I wish that. I I mean, that would be the easiest way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Can yeah. just like just have me manifest there, and then when the con is over, I just reappear back here. Yeah, there you go. Just and and, and you've got to worry about driving. Just poof. Yeah, but um. But so, uh, well, uh, I, my sense on the whole, uh, what order should you watch it in? We actually had this conversation with a couple of people at GameStop at, uh, uh, at the release of the new Pokemon games. Uh, there was a couple people, there was a, a guy who worked there, I think a girl who worked there, we're, they're talking about anime, and then we're talking about, uh, Fate, uh, or Fate got brought up, and then I'm like, okay, here's what you need to do if you're trying to get into it. This is my recommended order if you don't care about the, uh, about the non-anime works i presented my order and the guy said no you need to start with unlimited blade works and i'm like no but you can't start with unlimited blade Works series because there's so much from zero that you need for the affordable unlimited blade Works series to make sense uh so uh yeah. uh i, I had a conversation fairly recently so the way i present it is it depends on what kind of experience you want to go for do you want easy to digest or do you want to jump down the rabbit hole learn as much nuance as you can and it depends on how much time you got to burn, because uh, I actually have two or three different recommended watch orders, uh, two or yeah. three different routes, if you will. Yeah, I, th- I think um, with with me, it just it just goes back to because again, the um, the thing about Star Wars, I think, is actually where where it becomes a pretty effective comparison is like art is never created nor experienced in a vacuum, and so the cultural the cultural context always matters. So. Um, this series exists in a different context now than it did when it was new. And it's exactly the point about the Illumina Blade Works series where it's like, um, the original Fate Stay Night visual novel and the Dean anime were not made with, with zero in mind, but because the Illumina Blade Works series was made in a world where zero already exists, it can't help but be made. It can't help but be but be made from a direct or direction standpoint as an almost sequel to zero, um, and so I guess I guess I kind of have to like I have to like back off on the argument because the I can like make a make a point, but at the end of the day, it's it's something that I have to r- remind myself about like accessibility. Where yes, um, that, that, I'll, I was going to say that. Yeah, well, it's it's more like nobody can go back in, in time and change the way they discovered something. Um, nope. And it's the anti gatekeeping standpoint that we hold so true in this group where like the people that honestly just pick up grand order through peer pressure and then have to reverse engineer the entire fate franchise out of that. It's, it's tough and they don't, it's not always obvious how to do it. And so the worst thing we can do is say, oh, no, you did it all wrong. You got it with Grand Order. What the fuck are you doing? It's like we can't we can't do that to them because it's alienating. So I guess I just have to Wait, try to remind myself of that. What you should do in that scenario is if you see that that's where they started, you'd be like, OK, that's good. Now, here's here's what it actually means. And you help them. You help guide them. You hold their hand and guide them through this magical world of fate. I yeah. think that would be the best approach to things. And. That's uh, accessibility is a very big thing. That was talk that I agree with uh, when I was presenting my two or three different uh, watch orders. I was like, okay, now first accessibility is important because again, we got Dean Stay Night is the only adaptation of the Fate route so far. And if you want just anime, that's where you're gonna have to go. But good luck finding those DVDs because they're not currently on any streaming service that I know of. The others are on streaming services, so it goes off from there. I um, thought Dean was on Hulu at one point. I don't know. I, I have the whole, I have the box set, so I've always just watched it from the DVDs and ripped it to my computer for making videos. So I don't know if it's on Hulu. Yeah, it's definitely not on Netflix. And as far as I know, it's not on Crunchyroll. It is not on Crunchyroll. That is correct. All right. Um, um which uh, still waiting on the next Prelia movie to come out because uh, yeah, Prelia managed to sucker me back in with Oath Under Snow. 
Uh, which yeah, that new movie looks good. Okay, uh, the only thing I will say, I, I made the argument, or I posed the proposition to you that you should watch Oath Under Snow even if you don't care about Prilia. That won't work with the next movie, because for the next movie, it continues Elia's story, so you need to know where they are at. But Oath Under Snow, you don't need to. You can just enjoy the movie as it is and pretend the rest of the series doesn't happen. So, just right on. take Oath Under Snow and cherish it and don't look back. Um. um it's funny we're talking about accessibility and and uh, how people like if it's a long running series and they jump in at a newer entry and they they can't go back in time and change that. Um, that was something that is going to be kind of the focus of a um, of a of a video I really wanted to make, but I feel again I feel kind of underqualified to make it because it's probably going to be an absolute undertaking in terms of getting footage and editing it together and i want i wanted to do a video that was basically um how accessible is your favorite jrpg series and it like goes into um again the it's not it's not talking about these series as if you never heard of them it's talking about them as if you jumped in with the latest entry and now you want to go down the rabbit hole and play the rest of them more or less so like if you got into final fantasy by playing 15 if you got into Dragon Quest by playing Dragon Quest Eleven, if you got into Persona, uh, SMT and Persona by playing Persona Five, um, and so on and so on. If you got in with the latest entry in the series, how accessible is it to go back and play the other games? And the substance well, it, of that discussion that would go ahead. I was going to say that doesn't just apply to JRPGs. You could take that with just about any game, uh, any game series or any genre. Like, uh, let's say. Um... Uh, Devil May Cry, I think that's a good example. You got Devil May Cry 5, and then you got to backtrack from there. You're like, oh, well, we got DMC Devil May Cry. Is that the same thing? And then you you backtrack to Devil May Cry 1, and you're like, oh, wow, these controllers are really rough compared to the future entries and uh, things like that. So it's not just JRPGs. I, yeah. I get what, what, where you're coming from, but uh, you also have a good point because JRPGs, good ones at least, are very story-heavy. So it's also a matter of where's the canon start, where does it stop, how are we handling this? With Final Fantasy, you can literally jump in with just about any of them, as long as they don't have a two in their title, and play any of them, and you should be fine. Yeah, most yeah that is accurate. Um, Although, so... actually, if you want a really good really good starting point for Final Fantasy, not even joking here, Dissidia. Jump in with Dissidia Duodecim to learn who each of the characters are, and then go off on their own individual adventures. Um, only, but... only, only problem is you get shell shock because it's a fighting game versus JRPG, so... So the reason that I the reason that I wanted to focus on JRPGs because you're correct. I mean, you can do that with any game series. I mean, if you, I mean, God forbid, if you played something like Resident Evil Five and then go try to go back and play Resident Evil One, how alienated would you feel? You know, you know what I mean. Or, uh, uh, I'll do you one better. You play Resident <laughs> Eight because of big titty vampire goth waifu mama, yeah. and you, then you decide to from there. Yeah, you, yeah. you play just for. The... But um, <laughs> but. The reason why I wanted to focus mainly on JRPGs is is the uh, again the substance of what's going to be discussed. So the um, not only how how accessible are the games liter- literally, like how how affordable are they, how easy are they to find, are any of them uh, available through digital download, are they accessible because of their mechanics, but also. From a from an external end. standpoint, Some not game. talking about just the game itself, but like how accessible is the fan base? What is the fan base's attitude towards the different entries in the series? Because with um, it's different with each one. So like with Dragon Quest, they have the most like loving, accepting fan base of any JRPG series. They love other Dragon Quest fans. And if you jump in with Eleven, they're like, yay, bravo, welcome to the team. We're so happy to have you, more or less. And, it, and they may have been playing since, here, here's you know... Here's t-shirt we meet on Wednesday, so... Yeah, exactly. They, they may yeah. have been playing since the original game or whatever. They might be, you know, um, RPG and boomers, more or less. And then you got Final Fantasy fans who... You got Final Fantasy fans who... Half of them will say the Seven is the best and only one that matters. And then the rest of them branch off and they're like 13 is good 13 doesn't exist well one and two were the only good one or no one was the only good one no one likes two. <laughs> oh, um yeah speaking of which you can probably see it on my on the corner of my window here i'm gonna break continuity for a second here there's a recommendation for a oh it didn't move oh never mind 
cool. It's actually like locked on the window of the. Never mind. Anyway, <laughs> so I was going to show. There's a Final Fantasy 13 video recommended in the upper corner of my screen right now. But anyway, um, so yeah, what Final Fantasy fans will do is they will pick one game in the series that is their favorite, and then one game in the series that is, that is their most hated, and it's never the same two games. So, um. A game that is your favorite is somebody else's most hated, and vice versa. And so, well, uh, do, do you want me to do you want me to go ahead and give a example here that is kind of relevant to one of our earlier conversation points? Um, put a put a pin in it. I'll kind of summarize, and we'll come okay. back to it. But like, as long as the fans agree that they understand that about each other, then they'll get along. The problem is that a lot of people jumped in with Final Fantasy fifteen, and that game is garbage <laughs> and i hate final fantasy 15 and it's like that game is so alienating to the rest of the fan base because from a from a fan base perspective even from like a cosplay perspective you're talking about like people are all cosplaying the same four pretty boys in suits and there's no variety and it's one of those yeah. things where if you tried to show up as any other character from any other game in the series you would just, nobody would know who the hell you were. Unless it's, of course, now 7 with the remake and all that, uh, bringing 7 I, back I've, up in popularity, but... Um, I've cosplayed Kane Highwind from Final Fantasy IV The After Years, and no one knew who I was. But, um... But, uh, uh, the After Years? <laughs> yeah. Uh, his, Sam, uh, will, man Sam will try to strangle you over that. <laughs> Don't tell Sam you cosplayed yeah. that. The only reason I did that was just because it was an alternate costume in Dissidia, and at the time, my brothers were cosplaying as uh, Sid from 7 and Ward from 8. So I'm like, Dracoon Squad! So I'm like, okay, Kane, he has a version that's just clothes and not armor? All right, let me do that. So that's the reason why I did that one. I haven't how even played long? the After Years yet. It was just an all costume. How long ago was that? Oh, that was uh, like 2011, uh, uh, 2011, 2012. Really? Do you have any pictures of that? Because I think I may have met them. I have one or two. You probably didn't because they only went to Persicon uh, here in Alabama. Um, they never went uh, to Dragon Con. No, we, we, no. Uh, Dragon Con's actually been a bucket list item for uh, for me and me and Josh at least for a while. Okay. Um, okay. So but never mind. Uh, I had some because there was there were two guys at Dragon Con I've known for a while that would that would cosplay uh, Sid and Ward respectfully. Um, no, anyway. Uh, so the um, go back to what the the pin you mentioned earlier, an example of um... well, uh, example of favorite and least favorite, especially when it comes to general consensus among fan base. Mega Man Battle Network. Uh, the the general consensus favorite and best in the series is Battle Network Three. I will contest this and fight people on it. You know, like not literally fight, but I'll <clears throat> respectfully disagree. Battle Network Three, I don't think was the best in the series because I think it tried to do too much. Now, having studied the development history a bit more, I understand they it's very clunky with what it did because they tried to do a lot to go out with a bang because it was supposed to be the uh, series finale, but then they decided, hey, let's make more games. But I feel that it was unpolished in retrospect when you compare it to the future installments, and everyone wants to hate on Battle Network 4 uh, because a, a big one is that a lot of times they'll have error in the dialogue. The translation team was apparently, you know off the rockers with this one because you get so many mistranslated lines and so many grammatical errors the most famous one being when the main character's mom uh just met this girl character she says what a nice young man she was and uh, like that's that is a meme in and of itself yeah but everyone hates battle network four and i'm over here like why does it get so much hate the gameplay is fun there's so many different storylines you can go through because the game is never the same and that's another one it has huge replay value because every other Battle Network game, it, you only get one save file, and you can't restart, or else you restart everything. So Battle Network 4 is one of those to where you don't get the entire game in one go. You have to play it multiple times. But this also means replay value out the wazoo, because you can constantly replay the game, but it's never the same twice. You always get different branching storylines and different paths you can follow. Which, yeah, some of them are extremely annoying and need to die in a fire. Looking at you, Water God scenario. But aside from that... I think Battle Network 4 is a diamond in the rough, whereas Battle Network 3 is often put up on a pedestal. Not just, and I don't think it's just because of what it tried to do but was clunky, but because of some of the downgrades from the second entry in the game, in the series, which this Battle Network 2, to me, is a top contender for best in the series. Not necessarily because it is objectively the best, 
but because of how much it improved from the first. When you're talking about how much you improve in between games, improvement and change are two different things. But the one that I think had the absolute most definitive improvement from an objective standpoint was Battle Network 2 from Battle Network 1. But Battle Network 3 backtracked a lot from the second game because I feel like they're trying to do too much. And some of it is nitpicking. Some of it, I feel like, I think it is a fair, legitimate criticism with how the game is played from a, especially from a completionist standpoint, because there's so much to do post-game. Just to give you a small example, you can only collect some specific summon battle chips if you have a specific style change, which style style change in Battle Number 2 and 3 is your different armor changes. You can only unlock... Oh, hold on. I just lost audio. Shit. Complete your battleship deck or complete your library in order to unlock the rest of the post game. You have to use this one particular style. Like, th- you have to use it. So it, it shoehorns the entire player base into this one fighting style that it d- dictates that you use it like is that making any kind of sense it's like here's all this variety but if you want to get the best ending you have to do this you cannot deviate from it yeah i lost Too about short. i think i lost about 20 seconds of what you were saying because discord quit on me and so right. i was like oh shit what happened i lost your audio <laughs> so i lost about 20 seconds of uh of what happened dang yeah uh, um, brief brief bre- in the comment section uh ranch it too hard he's dead you lost him <laughs> Um, yeah, no, that, that does make sense though. I mean, I, I see what you mean where it's That's like, true. um, sometimes you want a sequel to innovate and sometimes you just want it to iterate. Like you want another better version of what was already made. You don't want them to change the formula too much. And then sometimes you want them to make, um, drastic changes that, you know, that add more yeah. variety to the existing formula. Um, I will also say that I actually had the unfair uh, stipulation for this as well. I actually skipped Battle Number 3 and went straight to 4, and then I played out the rest of the series, and then went back to 3 after finishing the series. So, uh, in some ways, I feel like I, I personally backtracked it, so I didn't get to play it when it came out. So, I may have an unfair perspective. It's one of those things that you can't change how you were exposed to something. Yeah, It's just how it happened. So that's why my viewpoint may be a little bit skewed on this. Yes, I can take it for what it is, but I also don't have the same nostalgic feeling that others might have for it. So that's why my viewpoint is different. So, but yeah, yeah, start start with the long winded rant, but yeah, no, that that makes sense though, because it's just it's one of those things where, like I said, as long as people are willing to be honest with their experiences with it, because so like me saying that Final Fantasy XV is garbage is completely hyperbolic, because I'm not like not trying to devalue somebody's enjoyment with the game. If they liked it, that's fine. But it's one of those things where um, I can acknowledge why somebody liked it and also say, this is why I don't like it because this really alienated the rest of the fan base kind of thing. Um, yeah. And so it's a, it's a difficult like tightrope that needs to be walked. Cause some people will just be like, yeah, this one's awesome. This one is trash. Don't even play that one. It's trash. And like you're just you're you're stepping on somebody else's toes there, and they they refuse to acknowledge how inflammatory that is. And I think that's where the root of the problem is with those types of discussions. But um, so like, so, to tie, Dragon Quest is super tie this chill. Back to fate a little bit, huh? To tie this back to fate just a little bit, I will say when it comes to recommending fate anime, I will tell people don't even bother with Last Encore. I didn't think it was good as an anime as a standalone. And from what people who played the game have told me it's an even worse adaptation than it is a standalone yeah all i gotta say is i weep for the people whose first work was fate collide liner i weep for them yeah (laughs) because if that's the first thing fate you ever saw you're expecting some madoka magica card capture soccer thing with all this nope you are you are in the furthest possible version out there even more so far removed than fate extra and that is your first exposure uh, uh yeah. i mean it has it has good in it it really does but you're in for a you're in for a shock when you come back down to earth if you want to jump down tight moon rabbit hole you are in for a shock when you get back over here 
Um, <laughs> but yeah, the other the other JRPG series I wanted to talk about in that video. So like, Dragon Quest is super chill. Final Fantasy is divided amongst each individual game. Um, Fire Emblem has had two distinct like major schisms in the fandom, where um, so like Awakening, the game on the, on the 3DS, is basically the game yeah. that saved the series where it sold incredibly well. It innovated in the design. It got a bunch of new people on board. Right. But because awakening was so popular and it was a jumping on point for so many people, it made the older games less accessible um, by extension. And so all the older fans felt alienated because nobody wanted to play their game because it didn't have the features that the new game did. And so, then you have gatekeeping from the old fans and like just bitter alienation from the old fans where they think the new fans are illegitimate and there's just like a schism right down the middle. And then with, um, it's, it's almost star Wars and transformers levels of bad is what you're saying. Almost. Um, and then you have, yeah, in, in the sense of like, you know, purists and that kind of thing. And then there was yet another schism with the newest game, three houses where it's like you either played, Three Houses and nothing else, or you play because like Three Houses it uh, innovates innovates in so many different ways where it's like even the other new games are alienated by it and are less accessible to play. I had a friend that actually started with Three Houses and started going backwards to the other 3DS games and complained that the 3DS games didn't have the features that Three Houses did, and then I told her I said you absolutely have to play um the the game boy advance ones you'll get to meet my wife over here she's so beautiful just look at her um and uh <laughs> uh she was like no no i can't possibly play a game that doesn't have permanent death as a uh option i can turn off and i'm like okay i can't help you but um yeah You're so like we can well, not survive the winter and then um then with smt and persona it's like it's always been the case to where there's like modern persona and then there's everything else SMT is kind of is the schism there because it's like you have the persona three and four fans and you have persona one and two and all of the rest of SMT are like alienated. So you like the, um, the, the meme where it's like the, uh, but so right. The way to, the way to, um, personify, no, no, no pun intended. The way to personify this is like, think about the meme where it's like the mom and her daughter playing in the pool and like the other daughter is over there kind of like struggling to swim. And then there's like the corpse yeah. at the bottom of the pool. So, yes, um, it's like Atlas is up there playing or, or the fan base actually is playing up there with Persona 5, like, yay, Persona 5. And then Persona 3 and 4 over here, like, ooh. And then the rest of per Persona and SMT are, at, are a corpse at the bottom of the pool is basically the attitude about the Persona series right now. So like, there was a there was a schism with Persona Three, and then there was another schism with Persona Five, where it's like most people have only ever played Persona Five and don't even know that um, it's based off of a larger a larger series, the SMT series, and um, um, that is a that's a fan base that is very very gatekeepy and is not kind to Persona fans, and I think that's a stigma that has to stop. Um, but then from there, like, there's a couple of other RPG series that are not super gatekeepy, but I just kind of wanted to talk about their, um, their, uh, release method and how easy it is to find the older games. Cause you have like the, the ease games, the Atelier games, stuff like that, where it's like, there's a million of these things. They've been around forever. Oh, the Tales games as well. The, the Tales series, um, these games have been around forever, but how do you, where do you start? And if you started with this other game, don't feel bad. This is what you're up against trying to play the others more or less. Yes. Yes. Um, man, that reminds me a long time ago when dad bought the PS2 for us, uh, it came with a game called tales of destiny. It did not work. So we just got, we just kind of got rid of it. But then I, I found it on eBay years later for like a hundred dollars used. And I'm like, well, dang! I wish we could have got that working. We could have could have had something to sell here. Uh, but oh, yeah. uh, I've definitely I've heard of the Tales series. Tales of Symphonia is the ones that I hear talked about the most. Yeah, that uh, one is good. That was really good. I've definitely been I've been meaning to get into that one. I just haven't really made the time to because I mean, adult life and all that. Yeah, that's fair. 
I have most of the games in that series, but I haven't picked them up because I haven't like played most of them outside of Symphonia because some of them have very um have intros that are very tedious and hard to kind of get off the ground. Um, yeah. um I hear uh uh Eric brings up the point with any game series it's uh, hard to get into then go backwards because of the quality of life improvements. Yes, you are absolutely correct and then again that's why I say like before uh, I'm not going to go on too big of a rant but Battle Network 2 that's what makes it better than the first game because of all the tiny tiny quality of life improvements that just stack up over time and 3 took some of those away and it's not it, it, to me it wasn't as good or innovative. Okay, now ending that before I completely derail the conversation again. But yes, uh he gets it. That's exactly what that's exactly the point. Quality of life improvement. Yeah. Um on that note, we are actually about out of time here and <laughs> we went over a little bit <laughs> compared to what we've anticipated. Um my phone is at 10%, which means I will no longer be able to keep track of chat. Um and Michelle's waiting on me. We're going to uh watch some of the um the not the newest Yu-Gi-Oh series but the previous one and uh play some Final Fantasy 7. So, um do you have any closing thoughts before we end? Um it was it was good to get on here. It was nice to talk to you like this. Uh I I as far as my my content goes, I'm just kind of all over the place with where I want to go and when I feel like I'll get my next video out because life keeps getting in the way. That's honestly the biggest challenge as a content creator is having to juggle a real life and real job out of if YouTube isn't your job with making content, working for 40 plus hours a week, which you work, you work way more than I do. So you know about that. You're like you, you work at Walmart. So it, it's, ridic- got- I mean, being, being a, a, being somebody that gets paid salary where it's just like work until the job awful. is done is awful. It really is awful. Like, uh, uh, especially during the holidays. So, um, my my next video uh, from will probably be the um, the cosplay etiquette video that I've been talking about. I've been posting about that in various different places. I'm, I'm sure you've seen it. Um, I'm really yes. looking forward to that. That one is not going to be too much of a of an undertaking from an editing standpoint. Um, and then after that, I'm going to probably begin the Night Tow retrospective with Trigun and. Yes. Uh, I was inspired to go ahead and start writing the script for the... Uh, I want to do a video on the anime series Tiger and Bunny, which is a superhero series that um, has some some social commentary about superheroes and commercialism, uh, kind of like Hero Academia does, but it's a little more dark and, uh, and serious. And um, yes. the second series of that, like Tiger and Bunny 2, is coming out this year after a decade uh, since the first one came out. So I was like, okay, now's the time. going to go ahead and make this video. So, um, yeah, I think, I think the next couple of videos that are edited and scripted that I'm going to, or not edited, but are the next scripted videos I'm going to try to get out that are not just let's play stuff. I'm trying to get a ROM hack review of, uh, Mega Man Battle Network 4.5. Uh, uh, I'm doing a review, a review of a mod for that game that made the game infinitely more fun. Uh, then I also have a comparing the original Mega Man X to the remakes and other different ports of it, which the reason I want to do that one here soon is because I actually teased that one at the beginning of the year. I said, it's going to, the, this series of comparing old games and new ones is going to start this year. Here we are in December and I haven't even finished the script for it yet. So I feel way behind on that. Um, and then after that, I I really wanted to get an, another anime review out before December ends, but I, I just don't think it's going to happen with the way schedules are currently. So I'm uh, doing my best with what I can and just see where see where it goes from here. Yeah, that's fair. All right, guys. Thank you guys so much for coming out and watching with us. I greatly appreciate it, and we will see you guys next time. Peace out.